today, everyone, everyone's present. Um, item, that's item number one. Item number two, Chairperson's business. business. Um, I want to advise members that I'll be attending an informal meeting with the NA Affairs Committee in my capacity as Chairperson on Tuesday, 2nd of March, to discuss issues relating to the protocol. Um, item three, the draft minutes. Uh, that's from the 18th of February. Um, can I seek agreement for the minutes? Okay. Members okay with that? Um, so uh, I'll not be phys ph ph physically sign them until um, at the next available opportunity, which will be Monday, because I, ha I have to be in Parliament Buildings on Monday. So um, item number five uh, on the agenda. Um, I want to advise members that the uh, is an update on the climate change bill uh, discussion document. I want to advise members that, that committee staff were advised on Tuesday that the briefing paper for this uh, agenda item the, this you know, were, were still not available for the meeting pack. Uh, this is now the second time this briefing has been on the agenda and due to no provisions of papers has been deferred. This is despite two letters being issued to the permanent secretary on the issue. Uh, and the uh, of, uh, issue of late papers to the committee. Uh, the department has requested that the briefing is rescheduled um, for the, the meeting of the 4th of March. However, that meeting agenda is already fully, uh, is very full and there's no capacity at the minute to add in this additional briefing. However, late uh, yesterday afternoon, the committee office was advised that the briefing papers were now ready and the department requested that the briefing on climate change be reinstated by this stage, it was too late, as all the administrative arrangements had been cancelled and was too short notice to change them back. Are members content that the briefing on the climate change discussion document is scheduled for the 18th of March, uh, which is the next available date? Members okay with that there? Okay. And, um, okay, and despite this situation, uh, I have requested that the officials attend the meeting today uh, to provide an explanation from their perspective to the committee on why the papers have not um, been forthcoming. And I want to just point out that the officials will not be providing a verbal update on what is in the briefing papers. Uh, and members, uh, I'm going to request just to keep any questions solely on the issue of the lack of provision of papers. So I say we haven't got the, the discussion document, so it's it's not possible for us to do any scrutiny of it. So can we just keep our comments uh, on, on the issue of why the papers haven't arrived, because this is becoming a trend. So I'd like to welcome by Starleaf, uh, Colin Breen, Director of Environmental Policy, Arlene McGowan, uh, Grade 7 Climate Change Branch, and Anthony Courtney, Grade 7 uh, uh, climate change branch and um, I'd like to invite the officials to brief the committee on the reasons for the delayed papers on the climate uh, change document and members will um, want to ask some questions after uh, you provide that uh, explanation. So, thank you. Good morning Chair, can you hear me okay? Yes, uh, Colin, Colin, yes, right? it's Colin, Colin. Colin Rain, yeah, and yeah. I'm joined today by Arlene McGowan and Anthony Courtney from the yeah. team, which has been expanded since you last received a briefing in December. So um, I, think I'll, I think I'll begin by offering sincere apologies for not having provided papers for this meeting. Um, I hope the committee can appreciate our intentions were positive in trying to strike the right balance between aiming to engage with you at the earliest possible opportunity and being able to provide a briefing to facilitate that. Uh, you know, I, I fully appreciate it's unacceptable from your point of view what has happened. Uh, I, I'd also like to clarify that although we provided, we were, you know, been working at pace with the new minister in this, and yesterday evening all we had provided was our analysis of the consultation. So the other papers which we had intended to provide you was a briefing on the policy proposals for the draft executive bill. These are still with Minister Lyons for consideration. But unfortunately, as you'll be aware, Minister Poots had to step down as Air Minister for health reasons. And firstly, I'd just like to wish him well. Uh, secondly, I'd say, you know, Minister Lyons was parachuted in. He has only really been in for a few weeks. And he has said to me as early or yesterday and this morning that he's still considering these policy proposals, but hasn't yet reached firm conclusions because it is a very complex and extensive area. 
an area which had to take account of the CCC's recent expert advice, a full legislative review which my, me and my team carried out, identification of key elements for effective climate change legislation through looking at the UK Act as well as uh, legislation in Scotland, Wales, Republic of Ireland and other countries throughout the world. And to add to this, uh, Minister Lyons also had to take into consideration the early findings from the recent consultation, which only closed on the 1st of February. Um, and we got a high level analysis on the 9th of February. And this was the document that we had provided to the clerk late yesterday afternoon, but I accept it was too late to get it to the committee. Uh, Minister has said to me that you know he fully recognises the importance of this work, uh, but he really wants to ensure that the legislation delivers for everyone, which is why it has taken a bit longer. Now, I suppose to give you an explanation of what impact this delay might have on the passage of the bill uh, within the mandate. So the time frame was always ambitious, but I can assure you that my officials and myself, uh, all of the teams are working to uh, in the background to progress a number of work streams relevant to the development of the bill. And we're looking at options on how to minimise and mitigate the risks presented by any delays. Uh, the delay in providing briefing to yourselves in the committee will obviously affect when we're able to go to the executive with policy proposals and does prevent a further challenge. Uh, I fully accept that. Uh, this is another reason why we try to brief you at the earliest opportunity. Uh, and I had, I had thought that we could brief you on the 18th of February. And I apologise for now this being the second week where I can't. However, you know, we, ha we have built some flexibility into our timeline and we're still able to progress certain elements of key work, including development of drafting instructions, albeit subject to the position of the committee, minister and exec executive. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, and uh, you've already recognised this, I suppose, that I wouldn't be able to comment on the policy proposals for the climate change bill as it, couldn't, as it wouldn't be appropriate in the absence of ministerial approval. Uh, I, I am able, but I know you've said that you do not wish to hear it, give you some indication of what the consultation responses said, even at a very high level. But, you know, I fully appreciate that's not part of due process. But I did feel it prudent to at least offer and ask if it'd be interest to you. Uh, otherwise, you know, I'm happy to take any questions. And I would just ask once again that maybe you can respect the fact that there are certain things I can't say, regrettably due to the fact that the minister hasn't yet cleared them. Thanks for your time. Um, thanks for that, Colin, and we appreciate your explanation for that there. Um, and I suppose it's it's and it's not necessarily your jurisdiction, but th this is a pattern, you know, that preceded the current interim minister. This this is a pattern that's been going on for a while. It's caused a lot of frustration, a lot of pressure, and in uh, inhibiting us from doing our scrutiny role, and also putting severe amount of pressure on the, um, the, the the clerk and the team and the committee trying to get uh, all of the documents uh, put, put together for meetings and for us to fulfil proper uh, scrutiny. Um, I just want to just reflect back on that timeline. So the so 1st of February, the consultation closed and there's a high, was, there, was, that, was that high level analysis uh, um, presented to the Minister on the 9th of February, is that right? So that, that was... Uh, it was presented to us on the 9th of February. We worked closely with NISRA for a week to get that done. So that yeah. was presented to the Minister on the 10th of February, along with policy proposals, um, era briefings, uh, executive papers, a, a very, very large submission. Yeah. So it's with the Minister now over a fortnight? Yes. So that that's effectively that's where it's been effectively asked where it's been currently held up for the past fortnight. Yeah. So as I said, you know, the minister has said, you know, it's uh, he's new in post. This is a very new area to him, very complex and extensive area, and he really just wants to get it right. So you know, we have uh, we have one good chance at laying a a piece of legislation that works well with the UK climate change. Act and delivers on Northern Ireland's climate ambitions themselves. Yeah, so and he, just, he just he asked for more time. Yeah, obviously, you know, and obviously we have a we recognise those challenges, but we also recognise we want want to get this piece of legislation passed before the end of this mandate as well, which is another added pressure. Um, can you just move around the room, Philip. You have indicated you want to speak here. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. I mean, obviously uh, we have a new minister in post, but. Uh, the climate crisis isn't new 
uh, and the information around uh, climate crisis isn't new and the urgency to deal uh, with the issue isn't new and the fact that the North is the only place on these islands without legislation uh, isn't new. Uh, so it, this is very, 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 very disappointing. And I mean, uh, the previous minister, who, who may well uh, re return to post uh, in, in the near future, made some very disparaging comments about the climate crisis in, in the past uh, and has new, put his views uh, on some of the science around climate change uh, into the public domain in the past. And, and I'm just wondering, uh, given what you have said, Colin, in relation to the challenging time frame and what the chair has just said in relation to trying to get uh, important legislation through in, in this mandate, you know, I mean, I, I just sometimes question whether the time delay isn't more uh, in terms of impacting the possibility of getting uh, proper climate change legislation through uh, the Assembly and this mandate from a political perspective rather than anything else. Yeah, thanks, Philip. So um, I think uh, just to say on Minister Poots now, uh, any of my dealings with him in relation to climate change, he was very positive on getting this bill. You know, I, I am aware there there have been issues between you know, the various uh, words in the assembly, but since uh, you know my dealings with Minister Poots from maybe back in October, November time, whenever I first started working on this, he's been very positive about the need to get climate change legislation through, uh, and. In terms of uh, being held up for political reasons, I uh, well, I can't speak for the politicians, but I have no reason personally to believe that. And I can say from an official point of view, we are very committed and I fully recognise the need for this legislation and I really want to deliver it. You know, I have been on my team I'll also have been doing many 12 hour days to get a lot of things worked up very quickly. You know, consultation closed on the first, and the the amount of information we developed between then and now has been quite substantial. So uh, I I have no reason to doubt the commitment, but as I say, I can't speak directly for my minister. But just quickly to come back, I mean, I I certainly don't doubt the commitment of the officials. But you know, you, you did say, and I'm just going to push this a bit further. You know, any delays, even if they're short in terms of weeks, are, are putting at risk the the potential for getting legislation through in this mandate. Am I correct in saying that? Uh, I suppose the the thing is, you know, obviously any delay with with such a short mandate will have some implications. But we have been doing a lot of work to mitigate against those. So, you know, we continue to work with NISRA to get more qualitative analysis done. We continue to work with the, the executive office and departmental solicitor's office to look at all of the possible things that could come out of the legislation, what they would mean. Uh, we have started to draft uh, sort of briefing documents, uh, standard letters, standard submissions that we can then put policy proposals, draft bills, etc., into. So every stage, we can expedite it by doing all this preparatory work. We've engaged with officials throughout the other departments. We've engaged with counterparts across the UK, because as, as you rightly say, the other jurisdictions all do have legislation in place. So that engagement has been invaluable. And you know, we have had informal discussions with OLC, but nothing more than that, because we're not permitted to do anything more than that until such times as the executive agree to uh, engage with OLC. But we, we are doing everything we can to ensure that you know we mitigate the risks of delays. And um, I'll just reiterate again: we are fully committed to trying to get this legislation through. And um, you know, I recognise that most of or uh, most people are. And I would hope that you know, at every stage, there's a, an expedition like that. Oh, okay. Thank you, um, Harry. Harry. Yep, thank you very much, Chair. I think that's me on mute at night. <laughs> no, well, I do understand that sometimes things have good reason to be late, um, but I, I also know that it is creating difficulty for the clerks and all the, the members. And all I'll say is I look forward to seeing the key findings of the consultation. No, we're not going there today, but it's just I look forward to seeing those. So thank you. Appreciate it, Chair. Thank you, Harry. Uh, John? Thank you, Chair, and can I thank you, Colin, for, for, for that um, uh, information you provided uh, and also for, for the work done by the, by the teams on this issue. I mean, we know that, that civil servants often put in 
long hours that, that aren't recognised publicly. Um, the the uh, committee has previously wished uh, Minister Pitts well in his recovery and, and Minister Lyons uh, good luck with the new post. But for me, the priority here is to determine um, as clearly as we can, and I understand you can't speak for the political thinking, but as far as the team is concerned, is this a higher priority as it was to begin with? Is that your perception? Um, and if it is, then how are the delays being challenged to keep the uh, bill on track? Okay, thanks, John. Um, firstly, I'll just say to Harry, so there, there, thanks for your comments, and there is a copy of the analysis with the clerk, so you know, you're all quite welcome to see that. It's, it's a very factual document about what percentages responded to particular uh, areas so uh, it's you know it's it's worth a read and probably doesn't need a lot of background it's, it's just a good bit of information for you to have uh, in advance of the next time we speak uh, so in terms of the question on high priority john uh, certainly within my division it is the highest priority i have more staff working on that of two two large teams working on this which is more than uh, i think we've had anything been worked on before uh, i uh, I have regular meetings with the Minister in SPAD and regular conversations just to clarify because as I've said, you know, this climate change legislation is a big piece of work. There are a lot of issues in it uh, and you've put that across with the CCC advice, um, which also came in recently. You put that across with all of the other work we've been doing around legislative reviews and then you take that in the context of the consultation responses. That all has to be weighed up. So. You know, there is constant dialogue there. Uh, you know, the minister certainly isn't burying his head in the sand in this one. He is, you know, he recognises the importance of it, but equally recognises the need to fully understand it, because uh, you know, if he has to stand up in the executive and cl clarify the policy proposals, he really needs to understand them. You know, I have to say, whenever I first came to climate change, it took me more than a few weeks to understand what would really be needed to tackle this crisis and you know to some extent i maybe don't fully understand it but i'm starting to understand the legislative side at least yeah okay 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 john thank, thank you, you. Well, yeah thanks chair right. claire thank you chair um and thank you colin for for your attendance today um i know that you're saying there that the the paper has been or the summary of the consultation responses has been received by the clerk um, and I want to thank you for that as well. But you know, uh, by convention, that uh, committee should receive that three days in advance before a committee meeting. Um, and this committee meeting was scheduled for the 18th, and those that paper was only received late last night after our table pack had already gone out. Um, so I just need to record that that's the reason that we don't have it, and that's why we're having this conversation, I suppose, today. But what I want to look at is that so we're. The, the consultation closed on the 1st of February. Um, Minister Pope was still in office there, and I take what you're saying in terms of um, the ministerial change that has happened. Um, and I do note that um, Minister Lyons will be a temporary appointment until Mr. Poots comes back. So what I'm really um, wanting to ask is, given that Mr. Poots is back in the chamber this week, um, I don't know when he's going to resume his ministerial duties, but should we expect that um, if the minister changes again, um, that we will see further delays in having these papers brought forward? Uh, well, uh, so in terms of the timings, I honestly don't know who will be the minister and for how long. That's that's something outside of my remit. Uh, you know, Minister Poots was very well over the detail, very well over the advice. Uh, he didn't receive a full briefing on the consultation because we had only really started to analyse it. You know, we had, uh, I think I had passed on to him information on question one, which was uh, what the consultation response was and the preferred target. Uh, which incidentally was a, an evidence-based target, but I didn't, you know, I didn't get into much more detail than that. But I certainly think, you know, that Minister Poutz is well over the the general detail. Um, he he knows the policy proposals and have been discussing with them, him with them for several months. So do you, do you expect then, if Mr. Poutz um, resumes ministerial duties, that there will be no further delays? 
I, I, I don't foresee any, but of course I can't, I can't fully speak for the minister. And I don't, I hate sounding like a broken record on this one. But you know, there's, there, I, I only, I only know what I so far know, and I see no reason with what with Minister Poots' drive to get this in up till now. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Chair. Um, Patsy. Very much, Chair. I hope that the officials do appreciate and they've heard it that uh, lateness on arrival of papers makes our task very, very difficult to do, in fact, impossible to do. And that's why we're not going through the stuff today. Um, just on that, can you, can you advise me, please, just um, I'm trying to get my head around the level of policy advancement that, that the, the uh, legislation is at. And you mentioned there that it's with the, the minister. Um, can you explain to me what is with the minister. What level of policy advancement are we at? So uh, at the minute, uh, in accordance with process, what we're what we have at the minute is a set of policy proposals which we would seek executive agreement on, in order to commission OLC, that's Office, Office of Legislative Council, to draft the bill. So that would be essentially what are the main aspects of the bill and what are they seeking to do. Mm -hmm. um, that was the that was the part of the papers that so even if uh, I had have got the the consultation responses to you I had intended to also be briefing you upon the policy proposals so that that briefing uh, is still under consideration so I still would have been coming and apologising for not having all the papers even if I had have had some of them uh, so really th the next stage is getting that agreed with the executive um, well. Well, it's getting it agreed with the minister first of all, getting it agreed with the executive, uh, discussing it with yourselves. Then, when we have that, we would formally engage with OLC on development of the bill. Then, once the draft bill has been agreed with OLC and the minister, we would then have to seek a whole range of approvals before introducing the bill in the assembly, such as engaging with the Northern Ireland Office to speak to the Secretary of State, the Attorney General's Office, and then writing to the Speaker to see if a bill could be introduced. So, so the really at the minute, it's ag agreeing policy proposals are sort of sort of the, the thrust of what the bill will contain or won't contain, if you like. And what's the time frame then for a presentation of those policy proposals to the executive, or is there one? Uh, uh, as soon as the executive paper, the draft executive paper is approved, that will be sent to the executive that day i would imagine then we will give a particular time frame for response you know typically two weeks in this situation i would imagine slightly less during covid there were often 24 hours for example uh, but you know i don't think we would be asking for a shorter time frame as that and then the final executive paper has to be tabled at an executive meeting so it's uh, getting it tabled then you know a week or two later so sorry i'm trying to get is there a is there a time frame for getting it to the executive as in two weeks three weeks two months three months four months what what is that or is there one? Oh, so uh so once it's approved um it will be sent to executive colleagues straight away so uh you know that, that's it whenever minister lyons has finished considering and uh, approving the the various elements then it can be sent to executive colleagues straight away and then we would hope that it could be tabled at the executive fairly quickly after comments and you know then it's it's whether the executive colleagues agree it uh, so there's no there's no standard timeline as such for that uh, it depends on the agreement of, of, of everybody and whether you know they're willing to expedite etc okay thank you thank you um morris can you hear me chair yeah, yes, hear me? yeah, 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 Chair. Uh, Patsy has touched on what I was going to ask, uh, really. But if I could just expand upon it a wee bit, uh, what time frame is envisaged by us, the committee, to actually scrutinise this bill to make sure that we have time to read it, and we have time to digest what's being proposed before it goes any further? What's our time frame, uh, Chair? Maybe that would be better directed at you as, as the official. <laughs> what do you you think our time frame should be because this is an important piece of legislation yeah is this for me or the chair sorry both <laughs> <laughs> i'll ask you first colin 
<laughs> right. Well, I, um, I have to say now that uh, I would not get involved in saying how long the committee should take to scrutinise something. Uh, I think it would be outside of my remit to say so. Obviously, the quicker it pe can be scrutinised, the better. But it, you know, it has to be properly scrutinised. Uh, you know, every delay places more of a delay on things. But I'm, I'm not going to say you need X number of weeks, months, whatever to scrutinise. I understand, you know, the committee plays a very important role in this and needs the time to do it properly. You know, what I aim to do is get a draft bill early enough to give you enough time to scrutinise it, whilst also recognising the fact that, you know, this is an important piece of legislation and it is one we really want to get through. And I think you know, all of the committee recognise that. So, but. In terms of giving you a time frame, I would I would never step outside my remit and say such a thing. No, I I, I wasn't asking you to, Colin. I was, I was sort of saying, what time frame would we have as a committee, rather than uh, asking you to give us a time frame. But uh, it's very important that we do have proper time to scrutinise this bill because it is very very important for, for mm -hmm. everybody in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Colin. Chair, I don't know whether you can answer that any, any further or not, but well, I'll, 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 I'll put any pressure on you. <laughs> I don't think I don't think of no. Uh, from Colin, what you said there, it's the minister, the executive, the committee, OLC. Then there's number of approvals, and then introduced to the assembly. Is there any latest date that that needs to be introduced to the assembly in order for it to be passed by the end of this mandate? Uh, I think the basically I would say the longer it takes, the more difficult it becomes. Uh, you know, it, it 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 all depends on how the bill passage stages are. You know, I would have liked to be introducing it um, before summer recess so that it uh, you know can commence whenever mm -hmm. you return after summer recess. Likewise, if we could introduce it just after summer recess so that it could commence then. I think possibly any later than that and the timeline becomes incredibly challenging. Yeah. But it's, it's you know, there, part of it is, uh, and I know this is going to sound terrible, throwing it back to all of the politicians, is, you know, how, how quickly do we want to get this through if there are delays otherwise? But you know, it's not, I, I appreciate there is time needed for scrutiny, consideration, debate. You know, this is a, a huge issue, a very complex issue, one that can affect the environment, the economy, and everyone. Um, you know, I'm we're fully committed to getting it in, but we want to get it in in such a way that it's operable with the UK climate change legislation, operable with the way Northern Ireland works, and operable with what the people of Northern Ireland want. Okay, thanks, Seth. And William, William. William, do you want to come in for a question there? Got me now, yes. Yeah, William, I hear you. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I was on mute there. Um, no, in, in relation to today, I, I think we're wasting your time and, and you're wasting our time on this issue because we haven't got papers before us, but we all accept it's important that we get it right. Uh, there's a lot at stake in, in, in relation to Northern Ireland's uh, way forward in this. Um, in relation to Northern Ireland's contribution to climate change, do we do we know exactly what our contribution to to the to the overall climate change is? Uh, so, do you mean in terms of uh, our current emissions or the contribution yeah. to net net zero? So, um, in terms of our current emissions, um, I believe it's in and around four percent of the total UK emissions. And maybe Arlene or Anthony will come in and tell me I'm wrong if I am. And I think, uh, yeah, you know, I think, yes, Colin, I think, I think it's, I think it's four to five percent of the UK emissions. Okay. Thank you, Anthony. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks for that information there. Uh, well, Colin, Arlene, and Anthony, thank you very much for for coming on this morning um, um, and for answering our questions as to the reason for the delay and. Given us, given us um, a good indication of timeline that we need to look towards in terms of trying to get this passed by the end of the mandate. But we'll we'll, we'll be seeing you soon, and I'll discuss this in more detail. So thank you very much for your attendance. Today. Okay. Yeah. Thanks to the committee for the opportunity for coming in front of, and you know I, I look forward to coming back with a more meaningful update soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care now. Look after yourselves. Bye bye. bye, -bye.
Okay. Uh, okay, members, we're moving on to item six in the agenda here. It's an oral briefing uh, on uh, from the NI Farm Group uh, on the proposals for a farm welfare bill. Uh, the, I want to refer members to the memo from the clerk at page 16 and papers from the NI Farms Group at page 19. I'd like to welcome uh, by Starleaf, uh, William Taylor, NI Farm Group Coordinator, uh, Michael Clark, Neapa Chairperson, Jim Carmichael, Neapa Development Officer, and Sean McCauley, uh, Farmers for Action Steering Group. And I'd like to invite uh, the representatives to take up to 10 minutes to brief the uh, the committee on, on the proposals for this bill, and members will want to ask some questions after that. So you're very welcome this morning, uh, Matt. Um, good good morning, uh, gentlemen. Can you hear me okay? Yes, uh, yes, William, we hear you. I, um, Mr. Chairman, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to put our case. You and your families are all doing your best to stay safe and well. Um, now, we'll start here with uh, the, the uh, Farm Welfare Bill. The Northern Ireland Farm Welfare Bill um, is exactly what it states. It's a welfare bill. And it's important to understand that a bill that will raise farm gate prices to a minimum of the cost of production plus a margin inflation linked is not only humane, it will also stimulate the country's economy. As of 2010, 25% of farmers were below the poverty line, according to the Commission for Rural Communities. This commission was abolished in 2013. But considering other downward agricultural trends in farming and income, this number is likely to be much worse. The vast majority of farmers are less able to contribute to the economy, uh, both through consuming goods and through hiring farm workers. Accordingly, the majority of farmers would employ full-time workers if their incomes rose sufficiently, which would lead to an increase of 20,000 jobs, uh, all things considered. Um, corresponding to a 280 million positive fiscal impact. Furthermore, two additional jobs are created somewhere else in the economy, uh, further increasing the projected fiscal increase. More employment opportunities would also decrease the cost of welfare each year and increase the amount of capital injected into other industries, such as hospitality, retail and manufacturing. Furthermore, capital will spend more money on the 123 suppliers they on average purchase from routinely and other commodities uh, such as infrastructure investments further contributing to the profitability of those sectors. Clearly any legislation which promotes raising farm incomes to the country's economy. And just to confirm, gentlemen, this bill has precedent uh, in two fronts. Uh, number one, the bill was was modelled on the effectiveness of putting money in farmers' pockets, uh, in our case, necessity, uh, off the back of Roosevelt's 1930 New Deal. And this didn't work for the first 18 months, two years, and uh, an unknown until recently gentleman from Lurgan called George Russell pointed out to Roosevelt that he needed to put money in farmers' pockets, which he did, and the economy boomed. Uh, now, uh, at this point, I want to hand over to Jim to put his case forward and then take your take your um, questions. And we can't emphasise enough uh, an issue the welfare bill is and how urgently it needs to be put in place. So over to you, Jim. Can you hear me? Yes, Jim. Right. <clears throat> well, from our perspective, our perspective, we're coming from the view of farm families and farm family incomes and the composition of incomes. Now, a farm family is like any other one. It has uh, more than one source of income. And at the end of the day, one of that might be a social payment, it might be benefits. The rationale behind that being that the farmer himself can't uh, have sufficient income from his produce. Now, we have different models 
in Northern Ireland, we have vertical integration. We have not really in the beef sector. We have it in the poultry sector, the pig sector, and in a certain way in the milk sector, they're more dispersed because there's more than one purchaser. But by the same token, there aren't a lot of purchasers. Um, from our perspective, unless you have a proper income, you can't make sufficient investment to progress. Um, it was interesting a few months ago, whenever uh, the fellow from the Environment Agency, I forget his name, Colin, was talking, he was talking about people working 12 hour shifts. And as to be recommended, or there to be commended for that. But by the same token, if you look at the errors and the inputs that the people on, of the farming community are putting in, they're not getting a just reward for that. They have no control, actually, at the end of the day, over pricing. They, there hasn't been so much talk until the length of the grocery adjudicator came along to start to look at what might be difficulties in the food chain. Um, and I think in the document it mentioned about the, the our document, or one of them, part of what was submitted to yourselves about actually the responsibility, the risks, uh, and the rewards or other ways from agriculture, and that's one of the things we see when there's tests done now for active farmers, that they mention the words uh, risks, rewards, or enjoying the benefits. To be quite honest, the benefit to, to most of uh, producers, or primary producers I'm talking about here, is having a good, clean working environment, and I mean by clean, fresh air, where they can work outside, but the errors that they're putting on aren't, aren't getting the income. And it was something, when you look back now on the lines of what um, perhaps some of our delivery drivers uh, would be achieving from the parcel companies that's been reported and the press of late. Now, the word sustainability is a word which is bandied about a lot, but you can't have sustain sustainability without income, without a profit, without a margin that you can reinvest. If your present situation is that you don't get sufficient margin to do that, the, the difficulty then comes to the fore that you're under stress. Hence, we'll come back to the welfare issues here. Um, I have been working with farmers in difficulty for 25 years. Long before the advent, as a matter of fact, I was one of the people who was involved in the setup of rural support here because we had looked at other regions and we were involved with what was going on in different areas. We knew about the isolation. We knew about the stress. And what we're doing at the minute and have been doing for a long time is adding to that stress because the person who's producing uh, is like anyone else, uh, they're supposed to have a business and a business model. Um, in most cases, it's governed by the price they are given, not the price that will truly reflect their inputs. So again, you have this consideration among themselves is where do we go from here? How do we survive? And I'm talking about all sizes of farms, not just small farms here. I'm talking about all sizes of farms because the amount of death, and this was pre-COVID, pre-Brexit, pre-all these things this was going on. And the amount of death being carried not only by banks, but by suppliers, by anyone actually who you purchase for, uh, they, 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 a lot of people were already in difficulties. 
and people have to try and sustain and repay, repay this debt while at the same time not getting covered properly for what they're producing. Now, we did see, it was interesting, actually, this week, uh, we talk, there was a lot of talk about the protocol in this past week, and one or two of the issues come up uh, on the news was the import of things like mints of pork, of things which we export. Now, people might say that if you start looking at business models where where you set a minimum price, you could interfere with certain issues, you could create more competition, you could do this. Already, we have a farm quality assurance scheme. We have a red tractor scheme, which extends to here for milk and for pork. So we are producing what most people would say is the best most uh, best quality produce and at the same time businesses are important uh, meat and all our products here to compete what we're producing uh, a surplus of if you like at the minute that in itself is causing stress so really and truly what this Bill uh, is about, from our perspective anyway, is the reflection of this back on the stresses felt by farmers, their families, and again we're talking about looking for transparency in contracts. I note that, for instance, the chair has a, a, a proposal for the LFAs and ANCs coming forward. Uh, and that would reflect our position. Uh, we know that left is on its own devices. Uh, agriculture in itself would not, or most likely would not, sustain the farming communities we have. Uh, we want to protect the environment as well as have an income and improve the health and well-being of the population. Um, that's all at this stage I have to say if people want to ask questions. I think I'm trying to give a bit of background here. Okay. Um, thank you for that, uh, William and Jim. Um, we have a number of members uh, looking to ask questions here. But before I do that there, I just want to... Just uh, thank you for the oral, for the, the written briefing and the oral briefing. And I, I obviously have been following this for some time, and I was very taken by the explanation that you did provide in your briefing paper, where you compared the pricing to like an inverted triangle, whereby your 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 farmer will have the animal for three years and put in all the hours and all the investment. The processor may have it for three weeks, and the retailer may have it for the, for three days. But the the, the the farmer took all the risk and all the effort. But they're the ones that are shortchanged. So I think it is absolutely no question that there is a massive massive imbalance uh, in the in the in the food supply chain, and that this uh, bill will go some way to help uh, redress that. And we did have. Uh, very early high hopes, which were um, unfounded, that the grocery code adjudicator might be able to introduce some sort of fairness into the food, food supply chain whenever it was introduced a number of years ago. And I remember discussing this in the committee, but it, it didn't uh, amount to, uh, didn't succeed in doing what we had hoped it would it would do. Um, I suppose one of the things that just maybe want to just uh, pick your brains on is um, have you had any. Um, uh, interactions with DERA in relation to your bill, and indeed, uh, given the fact that we um, were on the same island as well, have you any assessment as to what the state of play would be in the south of Ireland? And I know that there was a, a groceries order, I think, was proposed a number of years ago. I don't know where that's at at the moment, but ha have you any assessment of where, where the position of the departments or the department here is in relation to your proposals?
So you will and you want to take that? I, okay, I'll, I'll have a go and uh, Jim, you can follow if I, if I leave something out. C can you hear me okay, Mr. Chairman? And yes, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. On your first uh, question, the reaction of, of DERA. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, over the years, this bill has gone on for quite some time now. We, we started out with this probably about 2013. And any time that we met, uh, we had put the case over the years and then it has intensified recently. Uh, you know, as of last year and 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 into this year, um, they keep they keep pushing back, um, and we are concerned that they and some other very much influenced by the processor end. We have to say, uh, because otherwise, why would they push back? Why would they stand in the way of fairness? They have the opportunity for ten to twenty thousand jobs. Um, and those ten to twenty thousand jobs, by the way, would 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 be created as we've already stated by farmers taking on uh, workers that they badly need uh, to lower their own hours. But on top of that, um, the the there would other farmers who are maybe a, a paramedic in Belfast or or a nurse, and they would decide their farms are viable, so they would go home to farm and leave a job for in the, in the city or town. So that that's the way it would work. And, and to be honest, um, you know, some within there are probably behind the scenes thinking that it's maybe okay, but we are not getting the response from them that common sense would tell you that we should be getting. And as I say, we do worry about the influence. Now, to go another step to Southern Ireland, um, Southern Ireland, as you know, we work closely with uh, Irish Cream and Milk Suppliers Association and Irish Cattle and Sheep Farmers Association, and they have been aware of the bill uh, for a long time. In fact, this all started uh, a comment that the, the General Secretary of ICSA made many years ago to do with Roosevelt's New Deal. And um, aware of the bill, and the idea is that in Northern Ireland, we have an opportunity here with the help of Stormont to put this into operation. And if, or if it's seen to be going in that direction, then not only will it influence prices in the south of Ireland, in England, Scotland and Wales, and the rising tide will lift all boats as we go along, as has been proved. Um, but the south of Ireland then would certainly consider having a, a similar bill uh, to put forward is the reaction that we're getting from ICSA and ICMSA. But basically, you know, we have to start somewhere and we have a good opportunity here to prove our case. Thank so I hope I've asked um, your question. Thanks, William. I'm going to move around the room here because uh, we're getting tight to broadcast and we'll soon start. Hi, uh, hi. 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 Yep, okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Carmichael and Mr. Taylor. Um, of course, I agree. There definitely needs to be fairness in the supply chain. Uh, don't doubt that at all. I'm happy to look at, is this the best way to achieve it? Maybe you could tell me, you mentioned Roosevelt and that, and now I'm definitely good to interest Mr. Russell has. But I just wonder, are there any examples of any other jurisdictions doing things this way? Thank you, first of all. Um, you, do, you do have other things that fringe on it, for instance, in Canada. Uh -huh. You have a milk price order on the Isle of Man that currently operates. Um, you have similar things around the world, but not as clear cut in, a, in that ours covers all the staples that mm -hmm. are produced in Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. and, and therein lies the strength. And also, we should, we should emphasize the climate change section of it, which is the anti-avoidance clause, which in effect is, is a climate change clause that, that um, actually... At the minute, we're making percent export in in in. Beef. So therefore, we don't need beef coming from Poland or Brazil or elsewhere. Because if you're going to have a change emergency, what we're in the middle of and getting worse, you cannot justify corporates buying coal to Newcastle purely for their profit. Because in those cities, both ends lose out. So the bill is 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 twofold, and and it's certainly there's a lot of new thinking in it. We've put a lot of years into this and a lot of experience from a lot of different people. Yeah. Okay. And tell me what impact assessments have been carried out. 
Well, let's put it this way. The, the impact, the impact of farmers going into decline financially mm-hmm. for everyone to see tonight from 1990 on, you know, from early, from early 1990s until now. And previously, when farmers money uh, and, and proper reward for what they were producing, it was a different world uh, as to the one they have now, as to the potential that far- farming communities have to spend. So uh, in all those years in between, we've had, um, in Jim Nicholson's time in, in, in Brussels, we uh, implemented, whereby in the dairy industry, one third of the farmers in any region could come together to sell their milk. Well, of course, that was never going to happen. And then, then we had other things like um, the 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 uh, the, the, the um, new conduct farm or the dairy code of conduct and 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 things like that have come and gone and are back again now for another revamp of what failed before. So, uh, to answer your question, Mr. Harvey. Uh, the, 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 the situation is so trans that you know, even without us employing uh, you know, uh, you know, an assessment of the situation, it's all in, in, in the farming press. It's all out there. And, and if you have any doubts, certainly speak to rural support and others, and you'll get it. And- can, folks, can I ask members to, if you're not speaking, to turn your mics off because there's a great bit of interference there that's making it difficult to hear, William. But if you're not speaking, turn your mute if that's possible. Sorry, did I ask you a question, Mr. Harvey? Yes, you did indeed. And maybe just to finish off, saying farm gate prices um, were mentioned, could you tell me the sort of difference at the minute sheep, meat, beef prices this year, you know, today, like compared to last year? Just to know. Thank you. That will finish. Well, l- l- let, me, let me put it this way to you. It is no accident now that, that we, that farmers live under pressure from, first of all, large, corp- large corporate food retailers, uh, large corporate food wholesalers, and then you come down as as our triangle that you were given uh, explains to 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 the the the, the uh, processors, whether they are corporate processors or co-op processors, uh, the co-op like corporates, they pay no attention to their members, you know, uh, and and this is you know this is another issue, but the point is it is no accident whether you pick chicken, uh, dairy, vegetables, potatoes, cereals. Take any one you want and average it over the last five years. And you will find that today you need to add 60% onto the price received to actually get it near to where the farmer should be. That is the cost of production, inflation length plus a margin. Now, I mean, we, we had foundations for what is the cost of production plus a margin with the LMC some years ago, whereby they... they uh, employed McKinsey's International to come in and do a fully independent costing of red meat, as in uh, sheep meat and and beef. And that was the foundations of of, uh, also how our bill would. And uh, I mean, even at that time, it was clear to be seen that virtually a 60% increase was needed. So to, to be clear about it, these big food giants have worked out just that they can virtually keep farmers working on a bowl of rice a week. And now it's got to the point where everything so much that farmers' way of delivering the fact that that's not working is an outpouring of mental issues and other things with and and and, and the suicide thing has got to be mentioned because it's up there. I, I think in the UK we're on probably one, one a week. Yeah. And of course, so, yeah, the key word there is... Fairness, you know, fairness is the key word. So, thank you. Thank you. Right, folks, just want to just re- reiterate that there, if, you know, for the members and witnesses, keep, keep yourselves in mute there so there isn't that uh, noise. Uh, Patsy. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Just um, uh, coming across there, I think I've unmuted okay. Yeah. So. Right. I'd like to thank William, William and Jim there for their attendance here today. And they've read your 
your documentation with, with interest. Now, there's two things about it just that I would like to ask. We've got a clarity around, and you've articulated the case, it's crucially important that farmers, the producers themselves, get, get sustainable incomes, good incomes, rather than being reliant upon as many are on benefits to supplement and top up their income. That's just not a sustainable position for for any business. Uh, but what I wanted to ask was, um, in regard to the, the farm pricing issue, um, the, well, there's two things. One is, in the here and now, what uh, engagement you've had with the likes of the, the processors and indeed the, the major retailers themselves, the major uh, food outlet retailers. And the second thing is, and this is good what you're doing in order to improve the the uh, value for for the product and the income to farmers and that. But ha have you looked at or considered the implications of any uh, potential trade deals that the UK might enter into that could, as a result, flood the markets here with cheap food imports, um, whether that be the US or whether it be New Zealand or wherever it might be, um, and how that might, in fact, uh, undermine the good work that's being done to try and sustain our local farm industries. Yes, yes. If I if I can just, um, I think I'll, I'll 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 say my piece and let Jim come in then to help Patsy as well. Um, you asked if we had engaged with processors and retailers. Well, mm -hmm. um, I joined my native organisation Farmers for Action in two thousand and two. And that is what we have done from then to now. And we have concluded these people, uh, for instance, the corporate food retailers, the likes of Tesco and Sainsbury's and others, um, they have got so good at their job uh, with the way they run their business that this is now rubbed off on the processors. And we are now in a position of not being able to know better position for our farmers such is the power of these people and 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 i mean we can't emphasize enough just how powerful they are we have seen it over the years and and yes we can go out and protest and we can give them bad publicity and we can tell the truth but at the end of the day when we're doing all that they are filling their boot they have done with an extra 25 percent during COVID. so the point is i'm talking about the retailers here now food retailers so uh and and the processors previous to that but there were it's just there was figures recently that stated that the retailers had earned an extra 25 percent in the last half year which sort of stood out still keeping the emphasis on both retailers and processors now going on to the trade deal thing and as i say then i'll let jim come in to help you out with both of those uh patsy but the trade deals thing the concern that, that cheap food would flood in take for example beef or lamb and um, now uh, if we are fortunate enough that, that the Agriculture Committee takes this bill forward and hopefully takes it forward as, as an emergency bill, which we would really like on, due to the pressures on our farmers, then if this was implemented, remember it ramps up over a two-year period, and uh, what the Westminster government gets up to with trade deals over that time is going to be revealed. But the point is that... As soon as we can get our bill on its way, we have a job of work then to do to, to, to put the case to Westminster, put the case to Stormont and the other uh, regions that they can no longer go off and do free trade deals, as they call them around the world, and carry coal to Newcastle. That is totally unsustainable from a climate change perspective. And we say that it needs to be pushed to implement the Isle of Man principle, which is basically that you use all the food that's produced in any region before you import a stitch. And when you do import what you need to top up to feed your population, then you import from your nearest neighbor. And fair enough, if there's nowhere else to get it other than Australia, if anywhere in between, well, you have still a duty to feed your people. So our point is that from now on, we have to have climate free trade deals. No longer is it acceptable to have uh, a free trade deal around the world anywhere that you feel like it has to be a claim to the free trade deal and if that can be brought along after the bill is put in place then everything will work in harmony and we'll have a better planet to live on yeah just i want to explore a wee bit, a wee bit further and 
I'm, I'm not quite sure there just on, on the first issue is um, these big supermarkets, the outlets, that's where, aside from your usual butchers in the main street and that, that's where a lot of people buy their food, buy their, whether that be sausages, meat, whatever it is, and uh, the opportunities that, that there are there. And I took Jim's point there about the the uh, the opportunities that now exist for local processors and one maybe not that far away from uh, our own respective offices in Cookstown there uh, for sausages on the lake. But we'll not get into that argument just at the moment. Um, at the... Uh, well I, well, I would, because if I was in their position and so on opening there, I would have all my salespeople immediately on the phones, ringing around every outlet. But back to the outlet issue, and the major retailers, they do, they are a significant player. There's no getting away from that, whether that uh, Asda, Tesco, M&S or whatever. And how they literally buy into this and work with this concept so that that food chain and sales that will be affected by this will be very, very important. So back to that original question then is the level of engagement with those major retailers and are they committed basically to support local producers or is the bottom line just literally the bottom line for the bean counters? Well, as as you would as you would know, uh, the, the the bottom line, as long as you don't lose customers, is uh, all about the money. Mm-hmm. However, um, I would have to say that the retailers, the retailers actually will do. Can you hear me? Okay. There's something there's me on the. Is that all? Oh. Are we okay? Yeah. William, that's okay now. Whatever's going on? Yeah, we're clear. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just to answer you on the retailers, uh, Patsy, remember, are you okay to go ahead? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. The retailers, um, occasionally when, when prices are up and over the cost of production, and we'll give you an example of that, and indeed we have a, I had a discussion. Neil of Moray Park some years back in the middle of it. Let me give you an example. Is is Some years ago, when biofuel was all the rage to mix in with our fuel, etc., the price of grain for about two years went up and away over the cost of production. I think it was maybe 18 months the price stayed up. And, and it was actually up and over what would be our cost of production if this bill was implemented. So for 18 months, you had grain farmers getting a proper income the Moy Park juggernaut was rolling on and other chicken processors, etc. And we pointed this out to Tony, Neil, Tony O'Neill. If our legislation bill had been in place, it wouldn't have affected the industry at all because nobody complained during that 18 months. So I think this brings it back to the point that the retailers... Uh, would find that certain farm commodities went up and over the cost of production, then they would see to it that they were pushed down again. But the point is, in this case, there'd be a red line in the sand that says, right, that's as far as you're going here. And mm-hmm. that's all that we want is the red line in the sand to, 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 to leave our farmers protected from the ravages of the large mm-hmm. food retailers, corporate food wholesalers, and corporate food processors. So I okay. answer your question. That's it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much on that, William. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Jim, what you want? Well, I was, I was just going to say, uh, uh, Declan has stepped out uh, as chair, so I, I'm going to be taking over as chair. So, Rosemary, you have a question. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. Thank you. Um, William, you talked about the red line in the canyon. You spoke of the red line in in the sand there. Do do you think? And I totally agree with you. Getting fair prices for your produce, of course, everybody needs that. But do you think in trying to achieve that, you will also put a block on? Well, not put a block on, but perhaps reduce 
reduce the benefits if prices are particularly good in the sense that you're looking at a fair price and you may prevent a little bit of competition where prices may be over the top and very, very good? Uh, Rosemary, just, just to make it clear, um, if the, the bill were implemented, it would ramp up your period, but when it gets to full potential, if the price of any one of the, the, the staples produced in Northern Ireland went up and over the cost of production, yeah. um, the bill would have no influence on that. But the, it, when the market would force it down again, then the red line in the sand would come in. Mm-hmm. Consumers uh, would not have to pay any more than normal inflationary increases as demonstrated by the, the, the biofuel story that I told a short time ago. The, the point being, the retailers control the price of food to consumers. And, and the only thing that controls them is Tesco, uh, Watch and Sainsbury's, Watch and Marks and Spencer's. They, none of us have any say on what they charge at retail end. They work that out for themselves and are quite capable of it. So I hope I answered your question. And I don't see any reduction in benefits, to be fair, of, okay. of what may be sold uh, just because of the way the, the market at that level works, if you see what I mean. And Jim, you might like to... No, I I would uh, add a couple of things, and then I would like, if I may have clerks there, to say a word or two. Sorry, Jim. There are four people here, and there's only two so far doing all the talking. Jim, can I just interrupt you for two seconds and ask everybody once again, if you're not speaking, just put yourself on mute. All right. All right. Go ahead. Right. 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 The first thing I think uh, to connect back to what Rosemary said there, I know Rosemary's getting a lot of feedback. It's just the look at this. And what we're talking about, first of all, is minimum, not uh, not maximum. But anyway, to come on then to what Patsy was talking about, and. Uh, imports to here and what might happen. Uh, uh, due to Brexit. Brexit, 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 Brexit. And there's one and thing, thing that thing nobody has mentioned that I had that spoken, about spoken about earlier on. Earlier on, earlier on. The, the produce the that we have here, here and the standards that we have to achieve are actually, are actually some would some say, would say above, above and beyond. beyond. But at the same time, we farmers are prepared to comply with them. Anyone looking to press this past week will, will see that the pork people are having a debate with Red Tractor at the minute because they feel they're going overboard. Now, if we have these standards set, if somebody's going to compete with us, number one, they need to look at the standards that we have. And it would be an interesting from that perspective to find out if our consumers are really interested in produce, if they're really interested in quality produce, or as some of us have believed for the years, it is the people in the minute, in the middle, sorry, the corporates, etc., who are setting the price. They're telling the people, the farmer and the producer, what the consumer wants. They're telling the, the consumer, this is marketing after all we're talking here. They're telling the consumer what he should be requesting. And they're the person in the middle who will supply and everything for a price. Should they import it or whatever? Don't forget you're working with the people who are going to have a margin. Yeah, unfortunately, Jim, I respect if they had a percentage yeah. on, as anyone you know. Jim, can I quit this phrase? Can you hear me? The, the different, the, the different, Jim, sorry, sorry I'm, I'm quite coming across you. Uh, the, the echo uh, that everybody else is receiving is terrible. So I think I've to just, there, there might be one of two issues. Michael Clark hasn't muted, so can I ask Michael to mute? And secondly, I'm just looking, Jim, uh, that you, you seem to be down uh, under two lines, so I don't know if there's two connections, and that's causing the feedback, but certainly... We actually have, we have another Zoom meeting going on in another room uh, here. Yes, that's probably... Oh, yeah, I understand about the, 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 
I, I'll go and see a bit. And, and let, let Michael Clark say, speak there and I'll go and see. Should I, I chuck somebody off in our Zoom? <laughs> Good enough. Thank you. Michael, do you want to come up and answer uh, the question? Uh, yes, Chair. Can you hear me? Yep. I, I, I heard that echo. I thought maybe there was two appliances on in the office, you know. Uh, and there was a bit of feedback, but you were saying I wasn't muted. I was of the opinion that it was. But anyway, look, uh, my contribution, I think William and Jim has covered the most of it, but I would just like to say from where I am here and, and, and the Sparrows, you know, that the, the family farm here used to be, you know, you could you could rear a family on five or six cows. You know, now you need five or six hundred. So we seem to be asked to produce more and take less. And about the permit thing, uh, you know, what happens there is the, the Tesco's and that, they set a price and a profit, what they want to give to the processors. And then the processors, they take their profit, and the whole thing is passed down, and it doesn't really matter whether the farmer gets a profit or not. There's no other industry, you know, there's no other industry that would work on. If, if I go to buy a tractor, you know, I'm told the price of it. I can't say, look, I'll give this so you go back to the man you bought it and give him less and then the man that made it or made the parts he takes less than it takes to produce them there's absolutely uh, no logic you know to that now uh, since 1950s and that's just before i started farming like we had certain um grants and stuff to keep us sort of our head above water like i remember the old the old hill farming which became the LFA and then the ANC. All that has disappeared, but it kept the people in the, in the rural areas, it kept them sort of viable. Maybe some of them doing a bit of work on the side, maybe their wives out working. But the way I see it now looking uh, around me, you know, I don't see anybody continuing farming because your single farm payments gonna go, you know, any, any we support. Any, sorry about that. Any anyway, support that we had is sort of diminishing, and 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 we're being asked to produce stuff for uh, for for less than we're getting it for. So, so like I know Jim Jim and William there has covered near enough anything. Uh, yeah, you know that that I was going to say. But if there's any other particular questions, you know that I could maybe. Uh, and Leighton is on the fire away, like, but other than that, look at you can go to Sean McCauley, I'm sure he has a contribution to make. Okay, Rosemary, you, you, yeah. go ahead. Can I just, just intercept there and ask uh, you talked about sustainable farming and trying to encourage young people back into farming, right? Now, the long hours, the hard work, the climate, etc., is all. It all actually acts to perhaps um, push young people in other directions. Have you done any work with young people or the sons and, sons and daughters of farmers that uh, would perhaps, uh, your, your bill would perhaps try and encourage them back into farming? Have you done any work to see what their thoughts are and how this bill would perhaps make them give up their jobs in the cities and return to farming, return to agriculture. Do you want to take that, William? I, th there's a, I think maybe, maybe we'll hand that one to Sean. I was going to say there's, there's an old saying that money is energy. That's a good clue for what will bring young people into the land again. But uh, let Sean answer that one if he can come in there. Sean, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you very much for uh, your time this morning. Um, Rosemary, just to, to, to answer your question there and to give you an example of it. Um, a couple of years ago, I had a dairy farmer rang me about, it was about the price of, of, of milk and that. And we talked about the, the family farm. And he had two sons who, who grew up on the farm and worked on the farm, but both had got educated and had got jobs. And I said, there's no one 
was no one coming home to to take the farm over. Well, he says, I, I have a wee problem. And he says, the wee problem is, he says, the two fellas have two good jobs. And every Friday evening, if I want to keep them young boys at home on par with the jobs that they have, I would need wages here in excess of a thousand pounds. So the big problem, Rosemary, is for young people that want to farm, the profitability is the big issue. Farmers do not have the money to pay to keep young people on the farm. Uh, many young people are part-time farming and are out working as well. But just to go back on a few things, uh, I think it's very important to, to, to concentrate on the, on the welfare issue here. This is a welfare bill. William has talked there about, about suicides. I think the rate at the minute is probably more than one person per week in the UK. Uh, the other aspect, of course, is that agriculture now has become the most dangerous workplace to be in. And I think the lack of profitability and farmers trying to attempt to do work that they're not perhaps fully qualified in and we're having accidents happening. Uh, the whole issue around uh, the issue of the likes of TB, where farmers are under pressure all the time with cattle constantly being tested and the dangers that that, that, that brings into the whole thing. But also, um, ladies and gentlemen, if we do not address this issue, and I think that, that, that everyone, uh, you know, if we look at this very carefully, the amount of support uh, that's given to the agriculture com community at the minute, I think we, we already see funding for rural development and other, other things being reduced. Uh, and I think that the support payments been paid to farmers are going to be reduced. And if we look at the at the UK farmers already, we see the way they're moving forward that over the next seven years, their support money is going to be reduced. And if that continues and we're not going to be properly paid for the work, and, that, and that's, a, that's one question that has to be asked all the time, why can farmers not be properly paid? But if that continues and we start to see our family farm structure disappear here in Northern Ireland, and we start to take farmers out of the countryside. What about the, issue, the environmental issues? What about the way the countryside's going to look? The, the knock-on effect that that perhaps would have to tourism and, and, and other things. But as well as that, ladies and gentlemen, we have this pillaging of the rural communities at the minute, where we see our rural schools being closed, where we see a facility such as post offices, banks, and businesses closing in our, our rural towns and villages. And that's that, 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 that the fact that the farmer, the farming community is not making money is a big contribution to a lot of that. So um, yeah. just, to, yeah. just, to, just to say, Rosemary, you know, that's part of the problem. You know, there's fellows out there would really love, love to be full time farming. But unfortunately, the, the, the financial, the, the financial you know, possession of the farm doesn't justify them being there. Okay, I I, I can understand for you what you've what you've said is you're telling me something I know. I'm from a rural area. I know exactly what you mean. But I am wondering how this bill will encourage succession planning in relation to young young people deciding we're not going to go to university. We do want to go to the city to work. We want to return home to farm. And how will this bill do that? Well, Rosemary, just, just to, to come back on that, as I say, I, that's why I give you the example of the farmer. I mean, one of his sons in particular, he said, would love to farm. But the, the financial resources are not there. Farmers, you know, why can farmers not be properly paid? That's the big question I have here. And... You know, we have went over and we've explained fully there the, the welfare issues that are, that are that are contributing to that. But Rosemary, I can assure you, if profitability was there, I mean, I, I, I recently spoke to a local machinery dealer beside me and, and we started to count the number of young farmers in this area. And I'm in an area here where there's quite a few dairy farms uh, running there. And we started to count the number of young farmers in full-time farming. And I can assure you, the one, we, we didn't even fill the, the one hand in counting the number. And I'm sitting here in, in North Antrim, a, a, a dairy, a lot of dairy farmers around, a lot of bigger farms around, and the sons are not there. Uh, and, you know, not only, you know, but that, that whole family farm structure, Rosemary, that's so important to us here. 
that's falling apart. It's falling apart at the seams. And I mean, I can assure you, there are plenty of fellows out there wanting to farm rosemary, but profitability, that is the, that's what, that's the big issue. Money, they cannot make uh, uh, the, the sort of wages that they would need to be making uh, to, to do that. Now, there are some of them out at part-time, but I mean, the part-time uh, farming, uh, part-time farming will not keep the sort of industry going. And bearing in mind, ladies and gentlemen, this is the backbone industry of this country we're talking about. This is not some sort of industry that was thought up yesterday. This is the backbone. I agree, food. This is the backbone. Jim, I see you're wanting to come in there. Uh, come on ahead. Uh, I just want. I just want to to to. Uh, the, the the conversation here has got slightly. I think uh, all, all of a sudden we're talking straight away about uh, full time replacing good jobs with full time. Uh, jobs of uh, equal income and all, nothing happens overnight. And Rosemary has mentioned succession there. The way to have succession, and we here have been working for years with quite a number of farmers. And the funny thing is, uh, my colleague could, could tell you here, the numbers of people we have here who are joining farm businesses, uh, and join them with a parent that's there wanting to get a foot on the door. And there are professional people who would want, and, and one of the ways they're going to, to start or to start progressing their farm is perhaps by starting off part-time, and I'm talking about a couple, excuse me, a couple of days in the week, uh, and using our money to invest to start to build up. This is what succession, and there are an awful lot of places here that even um, you you were uh, to take them over tomorrow on succession. If you look at what the work, for example, that John McAllister's doing, there's a lot of partnerships, etc. cetera. It's, it's not somebody taking over a full business straight away, but it's going in, uh, with somebody else, but you have to start somewhere. You don't immediately necessarily have to jump in, but you're taking an introduction and you're, you're uh, spending, if you're only spending perhaps half your time, you could do it on less and on a lesser income perhaps, share it over your, your uh, farming activity. <laughs> There are, there are people starting to do that. We have them. I have evidence of it, and we have them. So you have to start someplace to have succession. Unfortunately, uh, I would suggest that of one, it's one industry where enough attention has not been paid to succession. And identifying a successor is where I would say the difficulty is in a lot of cases. Because Michael Clark talked to me, come back to the 50s, and in and, and a lot of cases, it's uh, getting the person who has been there for years to actually uh, allow a bit of management from another family member to allow a bit of responsibility for that other family member. There's a combination of things here, but you have to start somewhere. And what we would like is that the person who's coming in could actually build something. Now, if they keep saying that there's no future in it, simply because of what they're producing has no future, what is the point of them trying to develop even from their other job? We, we've got to give them something they can aspire to or see, uh, because we're not talking about one generation here. We're talking about people who are coming in and you can see it out in farms who have younger, and I'm talking, I'm going to the next generation here. And you talk to a lot of farmers, and it's the future they talk about. And do they take hold of the future on their own business, or do they let it all out to somebody else to take control away and take charge? A lot of the younger, more progressive people come in there talking a lot more about the environment too than people were doing before, but they simply can't afford. 
Yeah. Sorry, I, I'm I, I get into preaching mode sometimes. Okay. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, folks. I'm back. Here. We, we have five speakers left, and the broadcast will eventually cut us off. Um, we need to move move on around the room here, John. John. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to all of those who, who have presented it and for the work they have done on, on this uh, proposal so far. Um, I'm going to try and be as brief as I can. Some of what I'm going to raise is being covered in relation to other jurisdictions and, and costings, and, and I'm raising a financial issue again. Not to be difficult, I'm, I'm, I'm sure those before us will know these are questions we're going to be asked going forward. Can, can I ask how um, the, the uh, colleagues here today would see uh, this interacting with other financial support from government. Is there any chance, for example, that should the bill succeed, there could be a negative impact on other supports on other financial support streams? And have they explored that in full with the department before they move forward? The, uh, could I just answer that, maybe, Mr. Blair? Um, the, the the bill care of that automatically because you will see on the front page that it's updated for inflation uh, annually. So to work out the cost of production for all the different sectors, any subsidy or support money will automatically be taken into consideration to do that. So at the end of the day, when that cost for inflation once annually, if that subsidy has fallen or risen in between, which is it will be unlikely that it will rise, but say it the subsidy or rose within 12 months, then that will be an automatic adjustment. So hopefully that answers your question. I'm talking more about how, how your proposal would sit alongside or interact with or put, put it whichever way you will with existing government agricultural support schemes, for example, the basic payment scheme and any others that might come out of current proposals. In short, is, is there a risk you could be asking to be given on one hand to have it taken away on the other? And that's what I'm asking you to address, uh, uh, and also, as I pointed out a moment ago, not to be difficult, but because these are questions that are likely to come up going forward. Well, I'll, I'll refer you back to the LMC when they uh, brought in McKinsey's to, to production for beef and lamb. The subsidies were taken into consideration during those calculations, as they would be if the bill was introduced. You okay. know, so that that's an automatic. Uh, an automatic job for for the consultants to do, and okay. and, and, and a part and parcel of, of what you would do to work out the cost of production, for yeah, yeah. safe produced. Right. So I hope Sorry, that yeah. wasn't let Jim come in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted a very very short comment. If you want to take the dairy industry as a case in point, where there's a base price set and a, a forward price set for milk. It doesn't preclude anybody from getting single farm payment. It doesn't preclude anybody from getting uh, support for uh, work they have to do on the farm. The type of support we could be talking going forward could change vastly. And again, and if, if the, the support system was equally for all, then any measures coming in would be equally for all. But they, if you, as I say, the only thing I can think of is coming to my head at the moment is the dairy and where there okay. is not maybe a good scheme, but there's there's money there, and yet that doesn't preclude you from any support. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, uh, um, William, William, sorry, William Irwin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank William and, and Jim for the presentation. And in the real, there's some very worthy and good points, I think. I have always said it makes, doesn't look to me, we're talking about climate change and we talk about carbon footprint, and we've lorries drawn meet across Europe, and we meet lorries coming back across Europe to Britain and the UK and Ireland uh, coming back. So it, 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 the whole thing doesn't make sense sometimes. Uh, in, re in relation to Many of the points you, you do make, uh, young people coming into farming and all, it is a big issue. Uh, the cost of production plus a margin would be great in the ideal world, but I'm going to ask you one question. If, for instance, the cost of production is deemed to be 30% lower than it needs to be to meet that cost, who pays the difference? Sorry, William, just to be clear, you're saying if the cost of production is 30%... 
Uh, yes, what the farmers receiving today is seen to be thirty, deemed to be thirty percent below the cost of production. Who pays the difference? Well, I would refer you back. I would refer you back to. Sorry, I'll answer that question straight up. The aim of this bill is to address the welfare issue on many farms by a proper, you know, delivering a proper income. But it's also to force the large corporates, the large corporate food retailers, the large corporate food wholesalers in particular, and to a lesser extent the processors, to lower their profits. Like Tesco, using example only, when they do their half year profits, remember the minute they make five pounds, they have all the bills paid, unlike what our farmers have. So do they need the billions over and above that? It's, it's the point where this is all going wrong, and all this money then finds its way to London or Dublin, depending on who the, the large retailer is. And it, 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 they are just suck, sucking the money out of, of rural Northern Ireland, rural Southern Ireland, rural Scotland, England, Wales. I mean, they, they, they're, they're giant vacuum cleaners sucking the money out of it. So what this bill does is forces them to lower their profits. It will not interfere with the, 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 what consumers pay for their food other than nor normal inflationary increases because they'll control the retail end anyway. The bottom, that's where the money is coming from. So in other words, what will be good about this bill is if on Monday morning it was, it was ready to kick in, uh, it would ramp up over two years. So in two years' time, when our dairy processors, for example, go to negotiate with the supermarkets collectively, they... Now, right, guys, you need to remember that this legislation bill is in place, so we have got to do our calculations over and above this. So that gives the processors actually the strength to stand against the retailers because sometimes we can be too sore on the processors from a farmer's perspective when it actually isn't always there. So this actually empowers them to get a better price from the retailers, albeit at the end of the day they're still struggling to, 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 to wrestle for their own margin. We're here to deal with okay. the farming issue. Just going to come out, and I, I absolutely agree with you. The big retailers dictate the price to buy up, the price to sell up. The, when they don't, they don't pay for the the goods to the have the till and run through their till, so they're in a win-win situation. But every effort in the past has been made to try and rein in the retailers, and we found it very difficult to do so. Um, and uh, we have a grocery code adjudicator and all the rest, but. Still, we were never we were never able to bring the big retailer to boot, and I I think that's a big big task. Okay, thanks, William. I'm going to just move on here to Claire. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to everybody for for being here today. And I know that we're really pushed for time on this one, but again, I, I think that you're a really valuable voice to hear from, um, and one that we don't hear very often, I suppose. And I'm hearing everything that you're saying about poverty levels, about mental health, about rural isolation, suicide rates within the farming community, many poultry farmers having to supplement incomes with second jobs. And that doesn't even take into account any free or unpaid labour on farms through um, women's work or wives and extended family members. And that prices are being led by processors and not producers. Um, and obviously then in Northern Ireland, we've seen the rise of the corporate agri-food sector over recent years. Um, White Park has been mentioned, but they're not alone, obviously, but some of those targets are getting profits of one billion pounds per year. Um, and this is also the link to the going for growth strategy. But the going for growth strategy is now finished, uh, and we're hearing from the minister that we're moving um, to a green growth strategy as a replacement. Although we haven't had the detail of that um, to examine in great detail at the minute. Now you mentioned the Isle of Man example, and I uh, I have looked at it, but I must admit briefly, and I think that it's a. It's a good example, um, but also listening to your, your comments earlier about the engagement with the department. Like we're in um, a particular time at the minute where we are coming up with, uh, you know, with Brexit, we're coming up with our own agriculture bill, climate bills. Um, I'm just wondering that the, the, the Westminster Agri Bill going through, we're looking at a model of public money for public goods. 
Um, and obviously then in Northern Ireland, we have no wind yet of coming up with our own agriculture bill. Um, so we will be following this model until such times. But we also heard again from this morning that committee that um, the department are working on a climate change bill. So I'm wondering, what ha, have you had any engagement from the department in terms of working, planning, or feeding into any of these strategies and bills that are coming through? Claire, uh, Claire I think, can I answer that? Um, the point about the legislation bill is that it's trying to address a problem that everything else that you have mentioned uh, should in no way interfere with it, nor it interfere with them of its automatic price adjustment annually. So in the, the bill, we have looked at all this over the years and we've taken everything into consideration. And I mean, if ever there was a time for this bill to come forward, it's now because as, as some of your other uh, speakers alluded to, our farmers were already under pressure before we had Brexit and before we had COVID and now the climate and what they do on a daily basis. So um, we're good to go is a straightforward answer. And we do not see any problems with actions that you have mentioned. And in, in, in a longer time to, to discuss it, we can... Who is it? Sorry, if anyone else wants to answer. Mega, just put the mute there. All right. Okay. All right, there, Claire. Yeah. Um, just again, one well, that um, level of engagement with the department. I mean, how often are the department in contact with yourselves, and how far have you been involved in any discussions in terms of? I mean, we've just this week at the assembly um, debated um, put through the single farm payment schemes. We know that that's just for a one year, for example. But in terms of the agri bill, in terms of the green growth strategy, in terms of the climate bill, what has been the engagement with yourselves? Um, Claire, we we have uh, any. I mean, over the years, we have always mentioned it to the department. When we've been there meeting them about all our issues, we have never missed an opportunity to, to have a go at them to try and see the logic of this. And and we did think that we were making some progress. It's thought that maybe it would go ahead. Uh, so to be honest with you, the department does tend to put us down. And, and no matter how we try to put the logic forward, and and their their reasons for 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 not uh, being as constructive as they should be. I mean, the last meeting we had with them, I thought they were constructive, and then what comes out later is sort of not along those lines. So, um, how should we say we're open? to have a real good go at them if you guys go ahead and adopt the bill and it starts to go through its process, that will be the time the department will have to sit down opposite the table with us and take it seriously. Okay, and the reason I ask that is because the, you know this being a standalone bill um, to address the issues that it does, so we're having the work on the agri bill, we're having work on single farm payments, we're having work on climate bills, uh, and we're having green growth strategies and we're putting all this in place, and you still hope firm to the fact that this bill needs to be included as a standalone bill in its own right? Well, everything, everything else you're trying to do for agriculture, um, founders, if farmers are not going to get paid properly, Farmers cannot deliver what you're expecting them to do yeah. in succession planning. Um, and, and, and on the safety issue, we have the worst accident record there is. You know, yeah. a cash-strapped industry can never be a safe industry. I mean, if ever there was any more proof needed, farmers used to be the people that gave to charities. Now they are becoming the charities. Well, so, okay. Um Jim, you're looking in the quick point. No, just a wee quick word. Uh, our, from our own perspective, from an IAPA's perspective as a stakeholder, we're involved in all consultations. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues asked where you're getting feedback uh, as having a, a meeting with DERA people at the moment there. Again, we had met uh, before in the single farm payment. It's been followed up there at the minute with an update simply because it opens on Monday. Uh, and the debate on it on this year's 
we we have had uh, ourselves and uh, the the UFU actually had a joint meeting uh, about three weeks ago with Jason Foy and staff on quite a few issues, and we, this this would be a regular update. The same with the the NAEA uh, or the Environment Agency. There are regular dates in my day for discussions with all these as soon as uh, we have on all topics. So we, we do have uh, access to delivery of and responses to consultations and we're consulted about almost anything that's going on. Okay, good to know. Um, you okay there, Sarah? Uh, I'm finished, yeah. Okay, right. Um, who have we got here? Morris? Morris? Yeah. Can you hear Morris, me, Chair? Morris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Morris. I hear Thanks you loud and clear. Look, I, I know we're pushed for time, so I'm not going to ask any more than two questions. Uh, and the first one of things to William. Uh, 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 William, I would agree that farmers are, are a vital cog in our community, uh, if not one of the most vital. Uh, but farmers are not being paid uh, suitable income for or reflective, and our income is reflective of the work that, and care that they put into the land for provision of food for our tables, amongst other things. But could I ask William how this bill compares with European legislation and Westminster legislation? And how will the passing of this farm welfare bill have a beneficial impact among the farming community? That's the fir first question. You may just go on, Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Morris. Uh, we've talked quite a lot about it, uh, Chair, and, I, and I'm thinking about the stress of trying to manage a farm. More often than, than not, on, on a shoestring budget, never mind the cost of beef and milk herds, but the cost of farm machinery to make a farm more efficient. And I can assure you, Chair, that none of it's too cheap. The financial stress in local farmers cannot be allowed to continue. Uh, farmers will simply stop farming, stop producing beef, stop producing milk, stop producing lambs, etc., etc. And what young farmer wants to put themselves under that stress for little or no profits? I think the bill is timely. I think it's deserving of support. I would, however, be worried that extra help for all farmers would be negated by the retail outlets to the point of uh, I'm making is we need to tackle the main problem in tandem with the farm welfare bill, and that is the power of the big retailers driving down prices while driving up their own profits, profits they are not prepared to share proportionately. Uh, and, and that's to William, if possible, please. Uh, Morris, uh, to, to answer your question, I think you've maybe answered it yourself. You have identified the problem, which is the big retailers getting greedier by the day, and and all for the sake of appeasing their shareholders and and and, and uh, incomes at the top. Um, so the, the bottom line is that the bill, uh, if it were put in place, is not anti-competitive under EU law, nor should it be anti-competitive under Westminster law, because it's a welfare bill, and welfare trumps the free market every time. So welfare issue, that's the ticket the bill goes forward on, understandably. Uh, the second thing is this bill will force the retailers. To look. That's exactly what it's designed to do. But over the years, as I said earlier, we have tried every which way between protests from here to we uh, and, and, and also our, our efforts with the grocery, sorry, our efforts with the in Brussels, which were successful against the import of Brazilian beef that was substandard. So we've been there, done that, and got the T-shirt. The bottom line is the legislation bill will do two things. It will force the big corporates to lower their profits, and the goes down this route. Southern Ireland will go down the route, and I wish to go down it. So will Wales, England, uh, Scotland, and maybe further afield when they see it's out. And on top of that, it's got the the added advantage of being a climate change friendly bill. So uh, it ticks all the boxes, Morris. And uh, if we had the time and the hours to spend, which I am free to talk to you whenever you want, if you want me in to, or, or any of us in to do so, um, I can assure you the bill ticks the boxes all the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's but, Thank you, William. And you live quite near me, so I, I, I will be in touch. Thank you, sir. Uh, Maggie, Maggie, you're looking in there, Michael. Michael? Yes, Martin. I just want to make a point. Um, William, the other William, William Irwin. Hi, William. 
asked, asked the question earlier about who would pay. Now, there's a perception out there uh, that if the farmers get more, that the consumer will pay more. But I think I would encourage people not to buy into that, that that is peddled by the retailers to try and show farmers as greedy farmers in a bad light. Now, a few years ago, I done a bit of research, uh, and I just want to put this in front of you. When the average uh, price of an animal killed at the abattoir was £1,350, um, right? Uh, we we kept a cow, a sucker a cow for 10 months carrying that, and we kept it for another two, two and a half years. And at three years of age, roughly, it was sold for £1,350. Within three weeks, it was sold, and a butcher told me this, for £3,100. So we kept a cow for a year. We kept the animal for two and a half years. We took £1,350 for it, and all the expense with it, like cutting our silage, taking the ground or whatever. And within three weeks, it went from £1,350 to £3,100. So put that, that that's, that's our answer. There's no reason for the consumer to pay one penny more uh, be, uh, if we get more money, there's absolutely, as a matter of fact, you could sell it for less. Okay, that's all. Uh, that's my contribution. Um, okay, then. Um, right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move around then. Philip, you're the last speaker here. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I mean, I had a raft of issues, uh, most of which have been dealt with. Uh, I want to thank the men for their contribution. Just one, one thing that's confused me, and I know it's kind of been touched on, but the anti-avoidance provisions uh, within the bill, uh, I mean, obviously, it, we do need to be doing everything and we can, that we can uh, to mitigate against climate change, and I'm supportive of that. I'm also supportive of people buying locally. I'm just not sure about uh, if there could be unintended consequences. First of all, I'm not sure uh, how sound the provision is that we can stop uh, the import of products from elsewhere and also the unintended consequences perhaps of doing that. So we, we could find a situation with the bill where maybe you know the, the farm prices, farm gate prices are, are, are good, but we actually affect our agricultural sector in terms of uh, exporting because you know, maybe the EU and other places will say, well, you know, you're, you're kind of not allowing us a free trade here. You know, we, we're going to head, head back. So maybe just a bit more detail on that. We could, we could give you the example of sheep meat, uh, Philip. The UK is self-sufficient in sheep meat, yet we ex of our lamb to uh, maybe goes via Southern Ireland, but some of it goes out uh, the docks in the south of England as well to France and North Africa. Remember now, we started off saying sheep meat in the UK were self-sufficient. So the sheep meat is going to North Africa and, and France, just to use an example, probably some other places as well. Uh, and that ship, when it's sailing south, is uh, literally meeting a ship coming from New Zealand with frozen lamb. Now, uh, the anti-avoidance clause would certainly have no difficulty in doing its bit with that because it's an effect saying, you know, you can't justify bringing that in and we don't need it. If we couldn't get lamb to top up our supplies any closer, then of course it could come from Australia. But firstly, if we needed lamb from Southern Ireland being our nearest neighbour or the Isle of Man or wherever. So... Uh, that is the purpose of the anti-avoidance clause. It's just to put in and, and, and also to deal with the climate change side of it. I mean, you, you remember Minister Putz last summer was livid, the fact that a certain abattoir brought in Polish beef when it was putting the rest of the farmers who were trying to deliver 24-7 and keep the food on our tables in, in, in the midst of COVID. Um, and right he was. Uh, so that wouldn't have happened if this had been in place. You know, to the detriment of our local farmers' prices. But I can, uh, you know, again, we can take time and explain that to you, Philip, you know, when we've got more time. Okay, Philip. You, you go ahead. Is there any more? Uh, no, no, I think it's probably, it is probably something that we can pick up with you as uh, separate to the meeting, then, along with a few other issues. Yeah. I, th I think on that point about the beef, uh, William, we, we took a, a very robust line on that in the committee last year. We actually wrote to all of the 
the, the, the major retailers um, asking for information from them about their uh, where the source to be from. That was during the, the beginning of the lockdown, you know, whenever f- farm gate prices were under pr- uh, pressure, even though there's a huge demand. So, yeah. so listen, folks, I just want to thank you for, for coming here this afternoon. I'm uh, sorry, the, the, the afternoon now. And um, that was very helpful and very informative and very we, we, well, de- very detailed answers to the questions. And no doubt we will be in contact with yourselves as, as this um, bill uh, uh, progresses further on ahead down the line. So thank you very much. And listen, either separately or as a group, we'll be in contact with you in the time ahead, OK? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. All the best. Stay sure. safe. Bye now. OK, members, um, we'll move on now to um, agenda item number seven. It's uh, a, an oral evidence session from the department uh, on the implications of EU exit and impact on of TCA on the various SRs. I want to refer members to the papers from the department which have been tabled. I want to also welcome by Starleaf, Seamus Mergerlian, the um, DERA Chief Economist, Mark McLean, Principal Agricultural Economist, Tommy McNamara, Staff Officer, Environmental Farm Branch. And I'd like to the, the, ask the uh, officials to brief the committee. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Um, afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, Seamus Wagerlian, and with me I have Mark McLean and Tommy McNamara, as you've already said. Um, Mark and I lead on uh, trade policy issues within the department, and Tommy has responsibilities uh, for regulations within the environment and plant health areas. We provided the committee with uh, quite a long written briefing and I suppose if I tried to go through it all in detail, we could be here for quite some time. But So my plan really is just to give you a very short summary of it. Um, and So I'll begin with the Northern Ireland Protocol, which sets out Northern Ireland's trading relationship with the EU for goods. The protocol allows Northern Ireland to continue trading with the EU without the need for tariffs, rules of origin, custom procedures or uh, SPS checks. So effectively, it leaves us in a very similar position to where we were before the UK left the EU, and that means we have unfettered access to EU markets. Um, So the UK-EU FTA that was agreed on the 24th of December 2020 is known as the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, or TCA for short. It has a very minimal impact on the operation and provisions of the Northern Ireland Protocol. In other words, it doesn't alter Northern Ireland's trading relationship with the EU for goods as is provided for by the protocol. Um, The protocol gives us unfettered access to the EU for goods while the UK government guarantees Northern Ireland unfettered access to the GB market. However, a downside with the protocol uh, is the fact that it introduces some friction on trade of goods coming from GB into Northern Ireland. And the TCA doesn't remove uh, the regulatory checks on goods moving from GB to Northern Ireland that exist under the protocol. Nor does it impact on the UK government's ability to provide unfettered access for Northern Ireland goods traded into GB. The TCA does provide another route Uh, in addition to those that are within the protocol, to avoid tariffs on goods moving from GB to Northern Ireland. So at this point, some people listening to me might be saying, well, surely there are no tariffs under a zero tariff deal, such as the TCA. But I think it's important that we remember that in order to be eligible for zero tariffs, goods moving from GB to the EU must satisfy rules of origin requirements. And in the case of Northern Ireland, the protocol includes some additional routes or ways that goods can move tariff-free from GB to Northern Ireland. 
The Northern Ireland Protocol means that EU state aid rules apply in Northern Ireland for goods and the TCA does not alter this situation. In terms of legislation requirements coming out of the TCA, we have not identified the need for any secondary legislation as yet. And to be fair, we're really not expecting that there will be a need for any. But obviously, you know, we're still exploring work, exploring this is, is not finished yet. So we just can't be 100% sure at this stage. So I'm going to leave it there, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much for that, uh, Seamus. Um, I say we, that came through in table papers yesterday, and I suppose we're, we're, kind of, we're working our way through it. Um, I suppose... Um, a note, a note from our correspondence today, uh, Seamus, that uh, we, we have in our packs, uh, know that um, that during the, the month of uh, January and, and February, um, like we've imported almost 300,000 poultry and 272 uh, livestock in terms of live imports into North. Have um, I see any of the, any of the, the uh, challenges that were experienced at the in the beginning of January, would you feel that they're they're being overcome now and, and things are moving more freely? Because certainly that's something that we've been getting from the Hollage people as well. Uh, what, what's your assessment of that? Well, to be fair, I, I haven't got data on those issues, uh, but you know, from I'm aware that you know certainly in the beginning, a lot of firms and uh, people were there was a lot of unpreparedness and I suppose that's not surprising given the fact that there was so little time to prepare. Um, so I think you know there definitely have been issues with uh, people, the pa paperwork not being correct etc and you obviously would expect that to improve over time. Okay and uh, whenever we got evidence from the the um, businesses and the Hollies people uh, back in, in January we would have found that a lot of the um, business, particularly across from Britain, uh, weren't weren't very well prepared uh, for the for, for the new requirements. And um, are you aware? Is that and this is something obviously we, we have highlighted. Um, you know, has there been any steps made to better equip the uh, businesses across from Britain to um, to, to work with the um, within the new arrangements? Because I am aware that. Uh, from listening to evidence in the past, that, that that a lot of pressure was put on the hauliers in particular, and those were are important into here to assist those small businesses with getting their their paperwork and getting familiar with the traces NT system. And also, we also heard evidence here before that that again across Britain that there was there was maybe businesses were were only informed maybe on the thirty first of December as to uh, you know what was required whenever the new um, arrangements come in the 1st of January? Yeah, I mean, certainly from our point of view, it, it was something that we were raising quite a bit with our colleagues in UKG and um, because we knew firms would be faced with some friction and uh, we knew that they would need time to prepare for that. So we, we, we certainly raised it uh, frequently with them and um, I suppose a frustration from their part was it was difficult to know what to say to firms in terms of preparing when you know they hadn't reached an agreement on what the new trading arrangements mm -hmm. would be like exactly so from their point of view it was always difficult um, that the trade deal was done at the very last minute and you see the um, one of the things that again was highlighted to us was um, um, a better communication, particularly at local level, with the TSS. Um, has that was that has that ever been ironed out or been uh, reconsidered? Again, I mean, I don't really have information on that specifically, but um, my understanding is, you know, that uh, you know TSS are are certainly. Um, have evidence that they're addressing all the queries uh, mm. very quickly, but I think there is feedback from stakeholders that really, although they are addressing the queries, they're not addressing them satisfactorily. So, 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's still issues, but again, with new systems, there's always going to be issues and yeah. uh, time will be needed to, to solve some of those problems without a doubt. Um, that's great. Um, we'll move around the room, Claire. Thanks, Chair. Um, and thanks, Shima, so far. Listen, in your briefing um, that you give to us, I'm looking at the climate change paragraph here and noting then that uh, the agreement establishes that framework for cooperation in the fight against climate change and that the strong principle of non regression is included there. But you're specifying here uh, that that's particularly including on, on carbon pricing is included within the agreement. And I'm wondering, I mean, we were hearing last week about problem getting trees imported from GB to NI, um, and that's obviously because of the soil that the, the trees come with, uh, with the root ball. So I'm wondering if there's a strong principle of non-regression, is that really just focusing on carbon pricing? And are we understanding within this agreement that climate change is really focused on carbon? Um, or why then does non-regression not apply to other standards to allow us to bring trees in, for example? Uh, well, I suppose they're, they're different issues. Um, the, 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 the soil on the roots of uh, plants coming in is it, very much about trying to control the spread of disease. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a different issue, if you like, um, whereas climate change is very much about, well, if you have regulations and measures that support uh, trying to address climate change issues, you know, we, we will try to avoid regressing and, and reducing those regulations or reducing standards, if you like, so that both sides will, will not regress from where they are now. Okay, uh, so but I think it, it mostly uh, relates to issues that do affect trade, you know, so you might be able to make changes to climate change issues that don't affect trade without, um, uh, without causing the other side to bring a dispute against them. Okay, listen, thanks. Just a wee quick one then to follow up in terms of trade and, and future trading agreements. And we know that the UK government then are seeking um, to enter the, the trading block with the CPTPP. Um, have you been involved in any discussions so far with that? Um, well, I mean, we are in constant, uh, regular, sorry, contact with our UKG colleagues. And obviously trade is not a devolved issue, so... You know they're very much in the lead on an issue like trade, um, but they do give us feedback on um, the discussions that they're having with trade partners and negotiations that are ongoing. Um, so, you know, we, we are able to ask questions and, and to provide them with information about you know things that we're interested in, defensive and offensive issues that we may have. Um, so we do get feedback on how discussions are going as well. And, and, and is there any any feedback then to committee really in terms of what has been discussed or, or where would our interests lie within that um, trading yeah. I I think you know the the, the TP uh, CPP is is going for, or sorry I got that wrong CPTP. <laughs> I have to keep practicing. <laughs> um, I think we're very early stages in that particular one, uh, but I might ask Mark to comment here. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Seamus. Thanks, Chair. Like the the main points, you know, that we put across both with CPTPP and indeed with trade negotiations with Australia, New Zealand, and um, mm. United States is that we don't want you know, any lowering of standards for food imports and also to keep tariff protection because we don't want a big surge of agricultural imports into GB because both of those things could clearly create difficulties for ourselves in terms of our competitive position on the on the GB market. And if there's an increase in goods in GB that don't conform to EU standards, then that clearly has implications in terms of trade between GB and, and Northern Ireland. Yeah, potential yeah. rocky roof ahead, thank you. Hey, Rosemary? 
Thank you very much for that. Rosemary? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, Rosemary. Okay, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for the presentation. Uh, my query again is trade between GB and Northern Ireland. You know, we have, you know, I'm not going to relate the issues. Time's too short to relate, relate the various issues in relation to um, SPS. But, for example, a lot of the trade that's coming in is staying in Northern Ireland. It's not moving elsewhere. It's not moving on into a European country. So is there any movement on that? Or is there any anything in relation to, how we can say, highlight, highlighting that fact and trying to, trying to get those goods that are not moving on, special, special status or whatever? Yeah, I suppose um, um, the issue is very much around um, plant health and uh, issues like that. So I suppose um, e even if the goods are not moving on, you know, if a disease was to be brought in, if you like, you know, it could spread by various means, you know, far and wide, if you like. So the rules around this kind of reflect that, you know. But I think Mark might want to add here as well. Yeah, the, there, there is provision within the, the protocol in relation to goods that stay in Northern Ireland as regards tariffs. And there is a trader scheme up and running, you know, to provide for zero tariffs under certain conditions if it can be shown that the goods stay in Northern Ireland. But there's nothing in the protocol in relation to um, you know, different rules applying on regulatory checks or SPS requirements for goods that move into Northern Ireland and stay in Northern Ireland. And I, I suppose the issue from the EU perspective is, you know, how do you prove that they stay in Northern Ireland? Uh, and as Seamus has mentioned, you know, diseases can spread, you know, goods could get into Northern Ireland that don't comply with EU regulations and then appear somewhere else in the in the EU and that would clearly, you know, present problems and you know, there's no customs checks or whatever between Northern Ireland and the EU. So, you know, that that's what's in the protocol in, in, in relation to that. There isn't any provision in terms of goods staying in Northern Ireland in relation to regulatory checks, but there is in relation to tariffs. Okay. So basically they're not accepting the not accepting uh, GB goods into Northern Ireland simply because you think obviously the standards have gone down or the standards may vary in comparison to Europe? Well, I wouldn't say that we're, we're saying there's any difference in standards, um, but I suppose it's more a case of that's what the rules say we should do in terms of checks. Um, yep. and, and that's as simple as that, really. Yeah, no, I, f I find that difficult to understand. And the reason I find it difficult to understand because goods in in Great Britain, they are also moving into France under the same rules and regulations. And I can't see as of any benefit for the goods within Great Britain to be of a lower standard than what the EU expect. When they're moving both ways, they're moving into France, they're moving... To Northern Ireland. Well, I think the, the rules are the same. So if, if the rules can move, if the goods can move into France, they'll certainly be allowed to move into Northern Ireland. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Pate? Pate? Okay. Pate, Pate you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, got myself off there. Um, yes, thanks very much indeed, and um, we, we do know that all the, the issues that have been discussed here were signed off on by the British government at a very late stage in, in the agreement that they entered into. Um, but um, what I'm trying to establish is the organisation, the principal organisation here that deals with and supports business, that's Invest NI. Um, what uh, I'm talking about the department. The department has a very big role to play, in particular in regard to agri-food sectors and the likes of that. What uh, liaison or coordination is there between Invest NI, 
and the department to establish in actual fact what A, the issues or problems there are, and B, the opportunities that there are. Because we're reading very in reports and I just want to deal in facts and I want to make sure that there's joined up government about the place and I want to make sure that we in the north here and those of us who are public representatives see everything being done well and every opportunity availed of for our people. So um, it, I want to establish what liaison or what harmonization of exchanges of information in order that opportunities can be availed of too is going on between DERA and Invest NI and the lakes. Yeah, well, I think over the last three or four years, the cooperation between the departments in the Northern Ireland Civil Service has been, you know, amazing. And um, there's been a lot of good cooperation, uh, especially around the EU exit issues. And um, I think that continues. You know, we do meet regularly with Invest and I, although Invest and I um, is um, more under the umbrella of the Department for Economy. Um, but, you know, there's constant uh, collaboration and, and discussions and as industry are bringing forward issues and stakeholders are bringing forward issues, you know, um, steps are being taken uh, to do what to do what we can to address those issues. Have there been any meetings recently? I mean, as in since the first of January, with directly with Invest NI? Uh, that yeah, you're aware I of? I wouldn't know of all the meetings that are happening, but I, I know I personally was in on a meeting. Um, before, since the 1st of January with Invest and I and colleagues from the veterinary side, yeah. Specifically around the issues arising from Brexit and protocol and any issues that need to be resolved, other issues that need to be taken as opportunities. Was that the nature of the meeting? Well, a meeting was a, a general meeting and we covered a whole lot of issues, including that one. Yeah. So the guidance is, is coming forward and being... Uh, update it uh, as needs be uh, as well. I think, Chair, it would be helpful if we had maybe, a, and I don't want to be benching you today, Seamus, but it would be helpful if we had maybe a wee bit more of a resume, either written or oral, um, just on, on on exactly those issues that, that are been dealt with at an interdepartmental level um, as we move forward. Yeah, um, I would I would agree with you, Pat, Chair, that, that would be helpful. Um, because I know that uh, you know um, that there's been a number of issues raised in some of the witnesses we've had from the hauliers and the business community as well. So that, that would be definitely be helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are you okay, then, Patsy? Um, well, thank you, Chair. Yeah, that's it. William. William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, in relation to the protocol and the issues around the extra cost to business and indeed it will lead to extra cost for, for consumers in this all. Um, it's also the increasing the William, you're cutting out there. You must be muted or something. William? Do you hear me now? Yeah, you're, you're, you're coming in now, William. Hello? Yes, we got you now. You got me now? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. In, in relation to the protocol and the disruption to the internal UK market and in relation to the extra cost to business, and uh, 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 that adds on to the consumer then. And again, also the uh, consumer has less choice. Um, we did mention early on, it was mentioned by someone there, goods coming into Northern Ireland that then are going on to, are possibly going on to the, the, the Republic of Ireland or into the EU, been an issue. But I mean, many of these, like seeds for the garden, uh, uh, consumers that want seeds and, and, and material for their own garden centres and for their own gardens, uh, they can't, uh, they go to the supplier in England like Sutton Seeds and they can't, uh, they no longer supply Northern Ireland. Uh, this is a major issue. Uh, can you see any way of addressing this issue? Well, I think it, you, know, the, you know there are certainly issues to be addressed, and, and work is ongoing on a number of them. Um, 
or maybe ask Mark to comment. On it. Yeah, like I don't really have a lot more to add to that. Like there is work on the way to see as much as possible how these problems can be eased. Uh, but I think fundamentally it, it comes down to the fact is that there's there's no agreement between the EU and the UK to align regulations in in in, in any area, and um, therefore the EU will treat GB as a third country and will apply the same rules as they do to all third countries who don't enter into arrangements with the EU to align regulations. But I do know that the UK government is doing the best it can in relation to some of the prohibitions and restrictions where it is possible to try and seek an agreement with the EU to you know, get those lifted or get some easement whereby it's it's possible. But the EU isn't going to allow anything into its trading block that it you know that it doesn't allow in from any other third country that doesn't have regulatory alignment. For me this protocol is unworkable. I mean and the more we see but I'm getting calls every day on a daily basis from business people, from hauliers. Uh, the issue that Claire raised earlier about there's literally tens of thousands of trees, if not hundreds of thousands of trees that are ordered for Northern Ireland can no longer come into Northern Ireland. I mean, this is a major issue. Um, and I mean, it doesn't look like it's going to be resolved. No, well, well as Mark has said, you know, there is a, a fundamental issue that um, if, um, unless, I think for the EU's point of view, they would want an alignment of rules before they would get rid of some of these checks and uh, allow some of these movements. Well, I can't see the protocol working as, as it stands. Okay. Thanks. Um, she was just seeing you there. Um, one, one of the issues that was mentioned was um, that the fact that 20% of uh, our, our um, goods are transited through, through Dublin. Is there, has there been any progress on the transit agreement? You were. Um, certainly, an issue that um, and I think I think there's a commitment to ensure that um, all qualifying goods from Northern Ireland going to GB will get unfettered access. Yeah. And um, there's a recognition that you know there is a proportion that goes through Dublin. Um, so I'm not quite sure where things are with that unless Mark has an update. You know, sorry, I don't, don't have anything further on that. And do you see the, the, the movement assistance scheme? Is there any update on that? Because I know that there was some of the stakeholders were concerned about whenever it happened again, uh, you know, the, and the cost of it be to them. The movement assistance scheme, um, I think that provides uh, people with uh, up to £150 to cover the cost of uh, export health certificate if they're moving yes. good products from GB into Northern Ireland. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, what was your question again? Uh, it's, coming, it's, 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 it's scheduled to come to an end. Is there any um, um, indication of it being continued or anything like that? I know this was raised by... I think it was a Victor Chestnut or maybe it was certainly one of the stakeholders I know wrote that at one of the evidence sessions we had. I think it's under review for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it may be something that they, they think they want to continue with or perhaps do in a slightly different way. But yeah. we haven't got an update on that as far as I'm aware. No problem. Well, um, well Claire, are you looking at the issue there? Were you, Claire? Yeah, thanks, Chair, very much. Um, I'm just uh, wanted to raise, um, I seen it on the news last night, uh, a news report about uh, a beekeeper in England who wants to import honeybees from Italy and bring them in via Dublin port up into Northern Ireland and then across to himself in England. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts on that type of transport route might be uh, and whether it flags up any potential um, threats for for us here in Northern Ireland? Yeah, well, I think if, 
anyone in, in, in GB that's trying to import goods uh, will be subject to the UK's SBS tax. Um, and I imagine um, that um, UKG will be carrying out those checks on, on, on products that are arriving. Um, I'm sure they have plans for dealing with uh, products coming through uh, Northern Ireland into TB, um, but um, they, they do want to ensure that Northern Ireland goods have unfettered access, so um, they're still, there's a phase one and phase two approach to that, so phase one is very much anything circulating in, in Northern Ireland can move into GB. So that might work for that um, beekeeper now, but I, I don't think it will work in phase two where um, there will be uh, procedures in place, I think, to carry out checks on goods that aren't deemed to meet qualifying status. Okay, it'll be interesting to see how the bees get on. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Okay. Um, okay, um, folks, uh, Seamus and Mark and Tommy, thanks very much for uh, attending this afternoon. Um, and we will we'll be seeing you again. So thank you and take care. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, um, I'm going to move on now to item number eight. It's a departmental written briefing, Agriculture Commodities uh, Coronavirus Inf In Support In Income Support Scheme, NA 2021. It's a page 46 of your pack. All vice members of the department proposed to make the SR under negative resolution procedure and is anticipated to come into operation early 2020, March 2021. Members will recall the executive agreed a £25 million financial con uh, support package following a case from the from Minister Pouch at the time make, uh, seeking to help alleviate the emerging threat to farm incomes due to the farming, falling farm gate prices triggered by COVID. 21.4 million was allocated to those in most immediate need, with 7.2 million retained to address any subsequent issues and challenges presented by COVID. The payment, the scheme provided for in the rule will allow the department to make income support payments to pig producers, poultry uh, broiler breeders, and organic milk producers directly affected by the pandemic impact on the agri-food industry. Allocation of the funding to these sectors um, uh, will be based on verifiable evidence and distributed in an equitable way to those sectors that can clearly uh, demonstrate loss. Uh, can I seek a comment from any members on this? Yeah, can I make a comment, Declan? Yes, I'm sorry, I should say, Rosemary, that Steve Miller, the head of Brexit Contingency, is on standby to answer any, any questions that we have on this. So, yeah, go ahead, Rosemary. Yeah, no, it's, it's just a question. It's my understanding that this has to be sorted out by March, by the yeah. end of March. Yes. Uh, given the given the difficulties that there's been with sorting out uh, other COVID-related payments that have been on the go from before Christmas. Yes. Is, is this feasible? Yeah, Steve, can you be brought into the, the spotlight there and answer that? Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, Chair, can you hear me? Yes, Stephen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, no, uh, that that the these two schemes um, that we're talking about, the pig and poultry scheme, uh, and indeed the organic milk top up, uh, is based on data that we already hold uh, in the department, or have already received from processors, and uh, we're currently in the process of validating that data. Uh, but we are fairly confident that these two schemes would operate similarly to the way our beef sheep dairy scheme ran last year, and um, uh, it would move through fairly quickly, and the payments would be made uh, by the end of March. Have enough, Rosemary? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Patsy. Patsy. Chair, you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Indeed, yes. Very quick question. I don't know whether Mr. Miller knows anything about uh, Rosemary is complaining about, rightly so, about the delayed payments. I wonder does Mr. Miller know anything about the payments to fishermen on or uh, fishers on, on Loch Ney? Um, and the, if there's one delay, that's a serious protracted delay. Uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, I don't know anything about that scheme. Uh, I'm purely focusing on the agriculture schemes, and uh, I don't have any detail on that one. Right, okay. Okay. Um, Steve, Steve, just uh, one of the queries that was raised with um, myself was in relation to see sows that come to the end of their life, cull sows. Is, yeah. there any, is there any way that they can be incorporated in the scheme, or is there any way of dealing with uh, that? Uh, well, we, we, we are, uh, and we have been uh, looking at that cull sow issue. Um, I've been talking to representatives of the Farmers Union on that one. Um, and we are putting together some ideas uh, as to what that might look like um, to meet the time scale that was referred to earlier about getting these payments out before the end of March. We really need to move on with this one now. And if we are going to do anything around cold sows, then it would follow on uh, at some stage later this month. And will cold sows not be incorporated as part of this scheme? No. Uh, no, uh, not as part of this one. This, this, the, the pigs within this scheme are purely for the ones that were impacted by the Cranswick closure. Yeah. Okay. Um, who else looking in there, Claire? Claire? Thanks, Chair, uh, and thanks, Stephen, as well. But um, my question relates to the horticulture sector. I know it's not with this um, th this legislation that we're looking at at the minute, but I wanted to ask you for an update on the horticulture sector, Stephen, please. Um, we're being contacted by many in the sector who haven't received a single penny in support from the department since COVID hit, um, despite being, you know, a, a scheme being set up. Um, and I'm particularly interested to hear from you if you know how many from the horticulture sector have put an application for financial support in and how many have been told that they don't qualify by the department. So how many have been left in limbo here? Okay, uh, thank you for that question. Um, the, the, there were 10 applicants uh, to the horticulture scheme. Uh, two of them subsequently withdrew their application. Uh, the eight that were left are being processed as we speak, and uh, we will be in touch with those people uh, very soon to tell them the outcome of their claim. And again, as has been said earlier on, uh, to get those payments made by the end of March would be our, our target. Okay, it was a payment before the end of December was the previous target uh, and people still sit and waiting. But of the two then that pulled out their application, do you know why that was done? Um, and did the department disqualify or tell people that they weren't qualified to apply? Uh, no, the, the two who pulled out their application uh, couldn't provide the evidence that we had asked for. Uh, so they withdrew their application uh, at that time. Uh, the others uh, did provide the evidence that we needed to assess their claim. And that's what's currently been worked on. And the two that couldn't provide the evidence, can you tell me if there's um, any, because they can't provide the evidence, um, are they just going to be left with nothing now, although they have suffered um, as much as anybody else? Uh, well, the, the, the objective of the scheme was to demonstrate that you had incurred a loss and they were unable to do that. And was that, was that um, eligibility criteria applied to every payment going out from the department for COVID yeah. finance yeah. assistance? Yes, there was eligibility, eligibility criteria for all the schemes, and if people didn't meet them, then they didn't get any money. And were there equal eligibility criteria? Well, it was, you had to demonstrate loss, financial loss. And so there's a belief these two then haven't been able to demonstrate that they have lost? That, that's correct. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, William? William? Yeah, okay. Uh, Stephen, I was off earlier. For, uh, I don't know what happened, but we got back on. Uh, in relation to uh, cold, cold sows, uh, I have been approached by uh, a few farmers in relation to that. Uh, they, they blame COVID. I don't know. They're saying that sow prices dipped from £150 down to possibly £30 or £40 per head. So, um, has there a decision finally been made on whether or not to pay a COVID payment on coal sows? No, uh, no decision has been taken. Uh, uh, that, that work is still being done to assess the size of the issue and determine um, uh, you know, a case for support. And until that is um, done, then the minister won't be able to make an announcement. 
Another sector is the zoo sector, and we have uh, uh, one in my constituency that I'm very aware of, um, suffered horrendously, um, but I've been fighting for some time, but it doesn't seem to have made much headway in relation to uh, some help or support. That's right. I'm, I'm aware of those um, of that of that uh, of those businesses, uh, but it's not something I'm involved in, so I can't really comment as to where that one is. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. um, you. Okay. Then, so uh, thank you um, for taking those uh, answers or those questions and uh, your answers, Seamus. And um, are members content to the merits of the policy, and we should move to the next legislative stage? Okay. I think that's a yes. Okay, okay members, we're going to move on to item number nine. It's a written briefing on the st statute of the air quality legislative functions amendment regulations 2021. The papers for the department have been tabled. I want to advise members the committee is asked to indicate whether it is. Con <clears throat> so what's happened? Seems to be all right? frozen there for about 30 40 seconds. Do you want to just go back to the beginning of that agenda? You was frozen, Stella, was I? I was frozen. Oh dear, yeah, sorry. Yes. Okay, um, okay. So, uh, again, the statute announcement the air quality legislative functions amendment regulations 2021 has been tabled. The committee is asked to indicate whether uh, it is content. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, as yes, consent, yeah, consent for uh, UK ministers to lay the statutory instruments in Westminster. The SI is scheduled for laying today in Westminster and is due to come into force 21 days after the day on which it is made. The SI will be subject to draft affirmative resolution procedure and its territorial extent is intended to extend to the whole of the UK. The SI contains technical and minimal policy amendments and has been given a category two assessment by DRO officials. Air quality legislative functions amendment regulation 2021 have no impact on the decision making or operating of the legislation here and will not constitute a substantive policy change. Uh, comments from members, members. Philip, I see you're down on the WhatsApp here. Thanks, Chair. Chair, I just noticed uh, towards the end of the, the letter uh, where, where it says we're conscious the committee will not have had the opportunity to review the SA. Uh, until today, uh, and also note that Scotland uh, is in a similar position and will not be granting consent for the territorial extent of the SA to include Scotland until after the 11th of March when the legislation scrutiny period finishes. So, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I see no reason why we, we shouldn't be following the example of Scotland, just given the, the, the rush time frame. That's not, I would propose that we do as such. Claire, are you looking in there? Yeah, something similar again. I mean, I, we know um, that the air quality in, in Northern Ireland is failing directive. So if this um, statutory instrument then extends to the whole of the UK, I mean, I'm assuming that the whole of the UK is already being um, mandated and legislated to uphold standards that Northern Ireland is completely failing on, you know, so it's that measure of enforcement and regulation and, and quality at the minute we don't meet it so I, i'm wondering what you know this is going to do in order to yeah. make sure that we're not breathing in poisons in northern ireland still and we yeah. know from the figures that it causes you know the air, air pollution in northern ireland causes up to five to six hundred premature deaths a year and that is year on year on year currently we have got caroline barry and colin nugent on standby do you want to bring them in till uh, there's any questions that yep be helpful um, Caroline and uh, Colin, do you want to maybe pick up on what Claire raised? Um, Philip, yours isn't really a question, yours is a proposal, is that right? Um, is there anything you want to pick up on there, Caroline or Colin, uh, particularly in Claire's, relation to what Claire said there? Yes, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, 
Uh, yes, um, just to pick up, the, this uh, SI relates to reporting under the European Pollutant Release and Transfer Register, which really is about industrial emissions um, uh, above a, a required threshold that's required to be reported um, in, in correspondence to a UN um, uh, protocol, which both the EU and the UK are signatories to. Um, obviously, then, the information that's, that's reported uh, will be used to, to help um, develop policy in relation to air pollution, but it is it is really essentially uh, uh, relates to the actual um, making this data uh, publicly available. And Caroline, will that include, if you're talking about industrial emissions, um, will that include an anaerobic digesters in Northern Ireland? Uh, no. Yes, it would, um, as far as I know. Now, Colin may be able to come in, come in at this stage. There's comments there. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I can come in there. Uh, I'm not aware that ADs are directly regulated under uh, the Industrial Emissions Directive. Uh, they are from other perspectives, and EPRTR is very wide-ranging in its content. So uh, although I'm not aware at the moment that AD plans specifically are an EPRTR, um, uh, it's something we would have to check uh, exactly for you, but uh, I'm not aware specifically of AD plans. Okay, so and then if we start reporting um, our emissions, um, what enforcement, if we are um, legislated for in a UK-wide framework, what enforcement measures, if we are failing to meet the, the targets um, set, can be taken? Uh, that's an interesting question, and maybe one that's, that's outside the scope of this particular SI. Uh, the, the register itself... Mm -hmm. Is, is not a, a regulatory tool, it's a public information tool, so it's, it's, uh, it follows the Kiev Protocol and the Aarhus Convention, which mm -hmm. is really about making information on, on emissions and uh, facilities available to the public. So it's not actually a regulatory tool as such, um, but the, the question you raise is a good one, but I, I think it's something we might have to take in the context of, of perhaps uh, future legislation in relation to industrial emissions. Great, that leads me to my last question then. Is there any intention for future legislation for Northern Ireland on clean air? Well, as you know, we're, we, we're currently looking at drafting a clean air strategy. So I think uh, there, there is certainly a discussion ongoing in relation to that. So I, I would think that, that uh, we're open to options on that. But certainly at the moment in relation to EU exit SIs, which this particular one is, there is no immediate need to make any changes at the moment. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Claire, um, and uh, Colin and Caroline for, for your answers to the questions. Um, we we have um, a proposal made by Philip that you know um, recognising the fact that the committee has an opportunity to, to review uh, this essay that and we should do something similar to what the case is in Scotland by. Just holding fire essentially uh, until um, the, the legislative scrutiny period finishes. As what number think of that pro proposal, or what do you reckon? Yeah, that's all right. How about enough? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, members, we're going to move on then. Uh, number ten is the departmental written briefing consultation on the agriculture wages order nineteen seventy seven. Um, I written to the Agricultural Wages Board, uh, written briefing on page 93. Minister Poots had instructed officials to commence the process to abolish, abolish the Agricultural Wages Board, which will require revocation of the Agricultural Wages Regulations NI Order 1977, subject to executive agreement. Minister Lyons is committed to progressing this work. Mr. Poots has written to members uh, of the AWB on the 21st on January in January to this year to advise of its decision to commence the process to abolish the board. The rationale to abolish the board is based on a number of facts which are outlined on page 94 through facts. Public consultation will be undertaken on the policy proposals and DERA officials will continue to engage uh, with AWB members and key stakeholders in development of the policy proposals and impact assessments before consulting more widely. Officials will also liaise with other departments as necessary, including in relation to the legislative process and applicable employment legislation. It is anticipated that the legislative process will take up to two years to pass to the various stages 
subject to uh, approvals. Um, do members have any comments in relation to that matter? Um, the well, the only one thing I will say um, myself, and perhaps this is something that uh, I took note on here when I was going through the pack. Um, I, I suppose it would be, if members are okay, I, I note that the, the agriculture, the AWB, the board, uh, and what it, it looks at matters such as workers' rights, holidays, pay, entitlements, sick pay, um, the terms and conditions. I suppose. Um, uh, members are okay if we could just get some, um, you know, um, guarantees or assessment from the department yeah. that those issues will be in terms of employers' legislation um, and their rights will be protected. You know, uh, in the event of this board not being there, I think that that would be. Um, I think that would be maybe fair to to ask that question. Yeah. Would, that be, would that be okay with you? Yeah, Chair, I would agree with that. Um, it's very important to, to ensure that people, that by removing the board, that you don't in any way undermine people's rights or entitlements. Yes, yeah. And 14% of agricultural workers um, are actually going to be potentially impacted here. So I think if we could ask, if we could ask the department just to make sure that their rights, uh, their rights are protected, they're, or they're not diminished in any way by the ending of the agricultural uh, workers board. And indeed, if there's been any, you know, Equality or rural impact assessment being being completed in this year because we wouldn't want to see any, and we can see the reasons why why it may be discontinued. But it also it would be important to make sure there's no um, regression or diminution of workers' rights in this regard. Is that fair enough? Is it? Is it okay? So, are members okay that we request a pre-consultation update prior to its launch? Okay, right. Um, there's a written uh, briefing there, uh, EU transition update. Um, the uh, I want to refer members to written briefing from the department uh, on an EU transition update, um, which has been tabled. It's tabled. It's not in your main pack. Uh, members may be interested to note that during January, the points of entry processed 5,800 shed. Uh, which is the Common Health Entry Documents uh, for Product Shed P of Animal Origin, which is around 16% of all shed peas across the EU. Um, and members are requested to forward any questions they may have on the update to Stella by the close of play today. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. um, the correspondence, uh, pages 105 to 413. Uh, I want to draw attention to one of the, the following. Correspondence from a concerned farmer uh, highlighting issues he has concerns with regarding the election of trustees for the Mourne Mountain Middle Trust Estate. The email trail has been tabled. Can I seek agreement to forward the correspondence to the department asking it for a written briefing uh, on, on the issues highlighted by the correspondent? Is, mm -hmm. is that okay? Members okay with that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Remember, we get action. The correspondence suggested in the index sheet, page one hundred one hundred four. Okay, so members, the, uh, the the number thirteen then is the forward work program, page four fifteen of your packs. There will be an update from uh, shared environmental services, an oral evidence update from them uh, on the twenty second of April, uh, twenty twenty one. And the committee are due to consider the draft DERA 2021-22 business plan on the 18th of March. We've been advised that there are a number of proposed changes uh, to be made to the draft business plan, uh, to draft business plan which, which need to go through the department board. And unfortunately, this would mean that DERA will be unable to provide briefings as planned in March and have asked for this item to be deferred until April. As there is now a free slot on the 18th of March that we, we can take the climate uh, change Potential cooperation around COP26 has been suggested for the afternoon of Monday, the 15th of March. And can members uh, indicate uh, uh, that uh, this date would be suitable? Um, you can fire it into the WhatsApp there, if that's okay, with us, 15th of March, Monday. And finally, can I ask that you note that the committee staff are still working with DERA to get a suitable date for the DERA minister to attend the committee? Um, members, 
Number 14 is any other business. Is any items you want to raise before we um, um, yes. adjourn? Yes. Sure. Right on, please. Uh, yeah. sure. um, I don't know whether you've seen it or not, but there is a video clip uh, going around on WhatsApp of uh, a herd of animals which had been put down. I think it was in Fermanagh somewhere. Um, now, I'm not sure of how contemporary it is or otherwise, but it had been raised with me to make sure uh, there seems to be somebody with, with a bit of narrative in the background who seems a bit distraught about it. I don't know whether that's the farmer himself or otherwise, but um, what I would want to make sure is that if we establish, uh, now it, it is quite, it could be quite distressing for somebody that, that hasn't seen this type of stuff before. So uh, if we could establish from the department the proper channel for this to be conveyed through uh, to make sure that if if there were animals put down, that it was done so humanely. Yeah. Uh, the, clip, the clip that I saw was from the person who was very bit distressed, seemed to be raising concerns about that. So um, if, if we could, could just convey for me or establish for me the mechanism by which I can convey that through to the department to ensure that all methods of humane dispatch were properly and adequately adhered to, uh, to investigate otherwise or whatever the mechanism is for doing that if we could find out what how i convey that through to the department please just yeah no problem um okay members thank you patsy for that and we know i'm sure we all support that uh, to be that far away from patsy so members the next meeting will take place next week we're into a new month uh thursday the 4th of march uh, at 10 a.m and it'll be a virtual meeting streamed on the Assembly website. So, um, Stella, are you looking in there? Yes, just before you leave, Declan, they, we were to get agreement from the committee that the, um, well, the Farm Welfare Bill would be provided to DERA and to RAISE so that they can talk on this issue next week at the meeting. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll all agree with that. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you, members. Listen, sure. See you all again next week. Okay. Take care. Have a good weekend, everybody. All the best. Bye. 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 Thank you. Is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.